Welcome to the Digging Deep Pay TV MX Podcast with your host, hailing from Kakana, Wisconsin, riding a CST Tires SSI decals traveling back Yamaha YFC 450R, four-time ATV Motocross National Champion, number 25. Cody Jensen. What's up, everybody? We're back. I'm your host, Cody Jansen. Welcome to episode 84. Shout out to Thomas Brown, 84 of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast, our high point review show presented by our title sponsor, CST Tires, available for purchase at shop.csttires.com. The dust just settled on another unforgettable ATV Motocross National Weekend, and boy, do we have a show for you. Shane Hit, Nick Janusa, Jaden JJ Launderville, and Casey Greek help us cover all the action from High Point before Nick DeNoble stops by to look ahead to Iron Man with us right here on the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. What else has to be said? Let's go! Let's quickly shout out all of our incredible partners before dropping the gate on the best review show of this 2022 season thus far. CST Tires, go to shop.csttires.com today. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew. Thanks to SSI decals, DID Racing Chain, Namira Technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV components, Impact Solutions, Lunderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, the financial advice of the Haymower Financial Group, Four Works Carbon, DP Brakes, Factory 43, Integrative Financial Concepts and their Safe to Race and Safe to Ride Insurance programs, Binky's Forever ATC Museum, Blunzall Oil, the official oil choice of Digging Deep, Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant, and Manscaped to get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Their Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer rocks, and you already know I adore their nose hair trimmer. Manscaped's signature line, the Performance Package 4.0, includes the new Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer that I rely on to help keep my beard on point, the best nose hair trimmer ever created, and an array of goodies like deodorant, boxer briefs, a travel bag, and more. So check out Manscaped, I wish I would have sooner, and get 20% off with free shipping by using code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Every time I see a Manscaped ad on TV or hear it on one of the big national shows, it hits me how rad it is that Manscaped is a longtime partner of Digging Deep. And we know outside the industry sponsors are rare in our sport, so be sure to use that Digging Deep 20 code to ensure Manscaped stays involved with Digging Deep and ATV Motocross long into the future. Support all these great companies that support us, and for any products that fall through the cracks, click that Rocky Mountain ATV MC banner on our website to help us out. The 2022 season is here, and we both know you still need parts and gear. No matter what off-road gear parts you need, Rocky Mountain ATV MC has you covered. But before you buy, simply click that Rocky Mountain ATV MC banner on our website. By using our specific link, we get a percentage of what you buy on the back end, enabling you to help us out while purchasing the parts you need anyway. And did I mention that you can buy OEM parts from Rocky Mountain ATV MC as well? Yep. Shipped conveniently right to your door. So click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner at diggingdeepatvmx.com to help us out while satisfying all your gear and parts needs. And you can do the same thing with our Amazon widget. So same concept. Simply click the Amazon logo on our homepage, purchase whatever your heart desires, and that will help us out down the road. We can't thank you enough for that. No new donors to shout out this week, but if you are interested in donating and hearing your name on the show, you can find the Patreon or buy me a coffee donation links on our website. And major thanks to all of you who have donated. You guys freaking rock. Now, it's showtime. The 30-second board is up, it's sideways, and the gate is down. Time to dig deep. Let's go. All right, guys, High Point Raceway is one of the most historically rich venues in all of American motocross, and we have a stack to line up for you tonight in an effort to do justice to this iconic track and more wild ATV motocross action here in 2022. Here to help break down everything that happened at High Point is a weekly staple here on the show from Impact Solutions. Say hello to Mr. Casey Greek. What's up, Casey? Cody, thanks for having me back. Um, What an awesome weekend we had there at High Point. Uh, For the most part, good weather and everything at least for Saturday. So excited to break this one down. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. It was good to get back to some, some dry action, at least on Saturday. So yeah, we got a, got a ton to talk about. 
And now also joining us is an ATV racing legend, one of the greatest ATV racers of all time, brought to you by Manscaped and the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer. Go to manscaped.com to get 20% off plus free shipping by using code DiggingD20 at manscaped.com. Please welcome 1997 GNC ATV Pro National Champion and winner of seven consecutive TT National Championships as a professional. It's none other than Shane Hit right here on the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. Welcome back to the show, Shane. And it's a, it's an honor to have you with us. Thanks, Cody. It's good to be here. Um, excited to talk about High Point this weekend. It was uh, it was pretty good. I hadn't been to a race for a while, and um, I love going. And High Point's close. It's one of them that I'd won at, so um, I love going up there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As soon as I saw that you were you were going to be at this event, obviously in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, we got to get Shane on this show. So uh, we had a blast the last time you joined us here. It was about uh, last December, I believe. We got you on the show, and man. Um, we talked about, you know, as soon as you went back to an ATV motocross national, we were going to get you back on here to chat about it. So let me first say again, it's an honor to have you join us, uh, be joined by one of my biggest childhood heroes is obviously, um, awesome. So tell me how good it was to be back at the races. Like you just said, I think, um, high point is kind of a, a place you go every time the series, uh, heads over to Southwestern Pennsylvania. Right. So, so tell me what it was like to be back at the races. It's been a little while. Well, it's good. You know, I got to go to Daytona, but Daytona is kind of different, you know, because it's not a full national. It's just, well, in the previous, it's just been the pro class. And then it's been some, am- uh, they had some pro-am stuff this year, but mm-hmm. it ran off, at- which ruined it. Um, Daytona is really not a full-blown motocross race to me, but um, High Point's special because, you know, it's it's a local track to me. Um, mm-hmm. I went to college at WVU, which is um, 10 minutes from uh, High Point. And I grew up racing District 5 at High Point. And so I love to go up there. It's, you know, and to watch the place, how it's changed from, from year to year. I mean, to, to back when I raced at High Point that, and to go up there and look at the track now, it's not even the same place anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's got a lot of history. It's close to home. Um, I know a lot of people there. Um, so it's, it's cool to go up there and, and watch. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so right off the bat, Shane, do you have a, a personal like favorite memory from High Point? I mean, like you said, you grew up there, you went to college right there. Um, but do you have a, a, a racing memory that stands out about your time there at High Point? Well, I can remember growing up, you know, when I, when I first started racing, that I raced cross country races there, you know, I had GNCC races there, local cross country races there. And then we did, you know, local district five stuff there, but obviously it was, you know, winning the national there in 97 and, but probably my favorite memory was, I think it was 2002 when I, when I won the second moto there, I got a fourth in the first moto and then I come out second moto. I ended up third. I think I ended up third overall. I think Corey Ellis got the overall. Timmy was second, and uh, I was third. But it was um, a brand new bike that, that Mike Walsh had just built me, and uh, we didn't even have didn't even have time to powder coat it. We just took it straight to the races, put it together at the track, and went out and run the first moto and got fourth on it. And thought, ah, I don't know if this thing's any good or not. And then I run away with the second moto, and I thought, well, it might not be too bad. So, <laughs> Oh, uh, that's awesome. I just love High Point. And the crazy thing is back when, when I used to go to High Point, you know, I was friends with Barry Hawk and a lot of the cross country guys. Those guys would all come out and hang out. So it was cool. It was always kind of a home race for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. It's obviously awesome to hear some of those old memories. I think that's one of those places, like I said at the start here, is just historic um, in American motocross in general and ATVs, it's no different. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to getting into some more stories and, and breaking down what we saw this past weekend, another kind of iconic legendary race. I think it's going to be one that goes down as memorable for all of us. So yeah, looking forward to getting into that, but before we get too deep, I could very easily say my impact solutions impact moment is how freaking cool it is to be sitting here again. Like I said earlier with a guy I worshiped when I was younger, but Casey, um, I'll give you the floor here for your impact solutions impact moment where we highlight something good or positive happening in in atv racing casey the floor is yours yeah i think this one kind of goes pretty easy and it's not something that was good it was just something where um <laughs> you just seen like how gnarly these guys are willing to go and it, it's the dame olander sky jump out of the middle of nowhere like no one expected that to go down i, I <laughs> I just watched the video over and over again. And if you look close into that video, I was probably the closest person to him as he okay. left the face of that thing. 
Okay. And I like freaked out because I knew like it was game over. Mm-hmm. And so just, but that's what these guys are willing to do. So I guess that's the point of why I'm using this as my example for the weekend or for this impact moment is just, dude, it, these guys are nuts. Like they it just, it's all out for the entire moto. And that's what Dane did. And I, I'm like, what were you thinking? He said, I wanted to make the pass. He's like, I still had a shot at winning and there was only a lap to go. So I sent it. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what he did. And so luckily, you know, I think we're going to get him a butt patch made for the next race. It should say Gumby because he had a pretty good one at um, Pleasure Valley last year and he jumped right back up and finished the race and same thing this weekend. So super glad he's okay. Yes. Um, and just insane how you can bounce like that and just pop up and run to your bike and take off. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so everybody's obviously seen the video pretty much at this point, the rip it off films video there. Um, that first, you know, there's a right hander right after the, after the downhill, after the finish line. And then there's, you know, left it's kind of straight away. It's almost like a little bit subtle S S kind of there. And on the right, there's a single and Dane must have not let off. Right. Casey. So that shot. Never. Him. Yeah. Right. But, but coming into there, like even Joel Hetrick lets off maybe just a touch. Cause that, that, that single has a, a way of just getting a touch sideways, the, the tire marks in it. And yeah, Dane must've sensed that that was going to be a place where he could maybe make the pass. He sends that thing never lets off, shoots him totally sideways. Like I said, everybody's seen the video at this point. And the crazy part to me, not only did he just bounce up, he's, he's trying to run to his quad at first, you know, he hits his head so hard or hits the ground so hard, his goggles fall off. Right. And and when he gets up, he's running and he's not even running to his quad. He's not even running the right way. And there was just no quit in this guy. And I, I'd love to see that. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's just like you said right there, it's like perfect. It kind of turns there, but it's not, it's real subtle. Mm-hmm. But when you come up over that hump right past the mechanics area or right before the mechanics area, you come up over that, you're kind of light. And when you just clamp that thing fourth gear, and I mean, it's no secret, Dane's machine is not slow yeah. by any means. So he just, no, I mean, I could see it. I'm like, oh, oh boy. And it just, you could see that just all the weight went to that outside rear tire and it just spun and then, you know, sideways lift off. So, um, <clears throat> you know, he, if he would have pulled that off and made the pass right there, he would have been a freaking hero. Right. But, you know, hey, I, you got to have balls to do that. And he did it. So good. <laughs> I'm just yeah. glad he's okay. Yeah. So he, so update is he's all, all good. He's healthy and feeling fine. Yeah, I think it's more the machine got the blunt of it. Uh, mm-hmm. It hit so hard. I just heard a bent subframe, a bent a spindle. Um, it shoved the bumper into the seal head. So, like, the shock didn't blow. But it hit so hard that the bumper went into the seal head, which made the seal head leak. Sure. But, like, uh, we already had a tore apart uh, yesterday morning. The shaft is not bent. Body's all good. Nothing bent on it. But it just, you know, leaky seal. So it's, they were pretty close to do for a service anyway. So we're going to service them and send them back up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Happy, happy that he's okay there. Obviously, that was uh, something I wanted to touch on as we went here. So to hammer that out right away in our impact moment is awesome. For my impact moment, Casey, I think I would, I would go with Joel Hatrick and the the Phoenix team running that Root River Racing themed SSI decals graphics kit in honor of the late Rich Gillette. I thought that that was. Um, just something that was really cool. I don't know about you guys, but I think it was just something that seemed really, really special to me. You know, there's very, you know, not that long ago and Rich was, you know, a guy that mingled with everybody. Right. But, um, it wasn't that long ago that he was one of the other competing teams against Phoenix. And just, to, I, I just, I don't know. I thought that that was really special. So I didn't want to let this opportunity go by without touching on that and how cool that was to see Joel Hetrick riding, uh, you know, his YFZ 450R with Root River themed graphics. I thought was, was really, really cool. So um, moving on then that was our impact solutions impact moment. And let's get right into the action then starting with timed qualifying. And I think things were pretty typical. That's something that we say, you know, week after week, I think on these shows with time qualifying, we know what we're going to get from these guys typically, but Shane, did anybody stand out to you in time qualifying? Did you see anybody out there uh, in the morning and think, man, I got to see what this guy has for the motos. Cause he's looking, looking spicy. Anybody stand out to you, Shane? Well, the whole, that whole thing to me really is new because we didn't do that back when I raced. You know, we just drew right. picks, you know. Mm-hmm. So yep. I, I was bad at that. But it, uh, 
but it was cool to watch that and watch how they they've done it. I mean, honestly, when we practiced back when I raced, you know, I, I wouldn't get anywhere near Timmy or Doug or anyone. I didn't want them to see what I was doing and they didn't want me to see what they were doing. And it's kind of still the same way. I mean, you see Joel one area and then, and then, uh, Chad will be somewhere else. And then, uh, so, and, and then of course, you know, where the timing starts is at the start finish line or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, and they'll, they'll go through the mechanics area and see where they're at. And then they'll try to get spread out and make a good lap. So, I mean, it, it's pretty neat to watch that. Um, I think that Hogue kid ended up second, which um, yeah. was pretty good. I mean, Joel was, I, I can't remember. He looked like he maybe ended up about six, seven tenths faster than, than everybody. Mm-hmm. And then second on back, I mean, you're talking tenths. They're all close. And mm-hmm. it, it's crazy that you, you take a lap that's a, a minute 40 something and, and they're split by 10. It really uh, is, yeah, yeah, it really oh, is. Oh, so Chad, just wait and see what Joel po- posts, and then he's going to try to beat it by a tenth. I'm like, you don't know a damn tenth, you know. Not- <laughs> <laughs> so the crazy, the craziest thing to me, um, the craziest thing to me is the best guys, and we've seen Chad do it for years, and and you know, seen Joel do it over the time, and the other guys as well. Brandon did it this last week. Um, but they, they can put in their fastest lap on the last lap of that second qualifier. And that's just amazing to me. We see it in the dirt bike world too, but that's just incredible how you can go ride for 30 minutes, basically between the two sessions. And on the last lap of that last qualifier, they have a way of just wicking it up. Um, that's amazing to me. I don't know if you want to touch on that Shane, but that's incredible to me. a little bit that has to do with, uh, you know, the first practice they go out, usually the track, they're, they're, they're still learning the track, mm-hmm. you know, and regardless, I mean, the more laps you get on the track, the more you know it, the better you're going to be. And, and I think, you know, later in that second moto, they've kind of figured out, you know, well, this ends, it's faster on the inside here or it's faster on the outside there. I mean, they start to figure that stuff out just riding around. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think they hold back a little bit. And then and, and plus, I mean, I don't think any of these guys go 100%, you know, unless they really have to. I mean, like even Joel, I think he'll doing the, the first moto. I think he was putting down lap times as fast or faster than he qualified. Faster, so I th- yeah, faster. I, always, I think you, there's always a little bit left on the table. It's just a matter of whether you make any mistakes or not. Because even if you go around and say Joel went up, a 145 even um i can guarantee if you ask him say that was that was the fastest lap of the day and you know and um and and i can guarantee he said well i could go faster because i messed up over there and you know right over there i messed up too and you Mm -hmm. know so but to them a mess up is a tenth you know Mm -hmm. so but if they could lay down a perfect lap which it's almost impossible to put down a perfect lap on something that long when you're trying to go that hard. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is for some people and probably not the best of the best guys, but it's hard to emulate that racing intensity, right? So, you know, when the gate drops, it's easy for a rider to just ha- know that they have to go as fast as possible. Time qualifying is a little different because you start a little lackadaisical and you kind of, you know, roll into it. So it's harder to, you know, kind of emulate that intensity at times. But uh, yeah, you touched on that. I mean, Joel was was blistering. So stop me if you've heard this before, but Joel Hattrick was fast qualifier heading into the motos. It was nearly by two seconds in that first session, man. He just from the jump right away, just had a, a leg up on these guys, but the pack was able to tighten that gap up a bit for the second qualifier in the second qualifier. Like you said, Shane, shout out to Brandon Hogue, who is second fastest. It's always notable when someone puts themselves in between the two current legends of the sport that are out there. Chad Whedon was third fastest, just a fuzz behind Hogue. Um, Nick Janusa was fourth fastest, which I thought was really strong for him. And uh, something that we don't always see from him is, is fast qualifying times. And then Michael Allred showed up as fifth fastest, but I, I really believe it was Bryce Ford who was actually fifth fastest, Casey. Um, is that right? Do you know anything about that? I know I texted you. I don't think that that lap by Allred's was legit top five fastest, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, the time that it showed in live timing, showed that it was you know i think for a while he was fourth and then he got bumped down to fifth but there was something that went on with like the way start practice ended and when he went and how it scanned i'm not 100 percent sure Sure. he wasn't even sure Uh, it really it showed up to like us where we're all on our phones in the mechanics area watching it and i'm like no because i'm like looking at his next times and i could tell he was putting in hot laps he's running good lap times but they weren't 
you know, in that 144 range and stuff where, yeah, they where were it was coming up. So they were, yeah, they, there were, was, they, were, they were they were 10th, not fifth, which is fine. I yeah. just, yeah, in my mind, I was like, yeah, I was trying because I knew it was going to throw off fantasy stuff and whatever. That's why I was I was examining it. So go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. So I got just like I was sitting there, you know, and like I always try to help those guys like the mechanics, like it's hard for them to look at their phone and write it on the board. You only have about you know, seven, eight seconds from the finish line to where you have to have it written down and have your pit board out for those guys. So I usually try to help anyone I can down there. And they're like, well, it's showing right here, you know, Michael's in fifth, you know, Bryce is in sixth. I'm like, no, I don't think that's going to hold up. And it's, you know, obviously I would have loved if Michael would have been had that lap time, but it's just, it was a glitch in the system, but it, they took care of it, you know, shortly right after. And, you know, yeah. his lap time was <laughs> held up to for a 10th and you know michael had a good day too so oh dude we'll get it was, into it he it had was a, awesome he had a killer day um but but on the, the sheets that we shared you know in the qualifiers that go into fantasy stuff like i knew that was going to up his <laughs> pick trend and then come to find out he ends up being the top finisher in that tier so uh i kept thinking to myself man i don't know if you guys would have picked him if you would have been 10th but man he did kill it so we'll get into that so uh happy for him there um but okay the last thing i want to touch on is what about Jeffrey Restrelli trying the tunnel jump and uh, taking a dirt sample there? Did either of you see that? I saw the video, but I didn't actually see him do it. And, and I talked to Jeff, and Jeff had told me, you know, we was walking through the pits, and Jeff told me he did it. And I thought, and he did it the first practice or whatever. And I'm yes. thinking, well, I mean, why would you do that? I mean, I mean, I understand some guys want to be the first to do stuff, but I was kind of, kind of, hang back and let someone else crash their brains out before I tried that so no one I never I don't think no one else even tried it after that so. right well well I think you know that that rip it up films video goes around last week of Thomas doing it and you gotta you gotta yeah. know that that puts the you know the the thought in people's heads Casey I'll let you touch on it as well yeah I I just had missed it I mean I I caught just like the tail end of his feet up in the air but didn't see what had actually went on and Joel had said something to me before he went out there. He said, let me know if anyone jumps that. He's like, I'm going to jump it. And I'm like, do you really think you need to? Like, there's no point. Yeah. And he's like, well, if everyone starts jumping it, then, you know, obviously I need to know. And I'm like, well, yeah, if everyone's doing or, you know, the top guys or whatever they're doing it, then you're going to have to do it. It's just going to be one of those things. And Jeffrey never said nothing. I mean, I talked to him quite a bit Friday night. I, I don't know that he ever intended on doing it until we got into that qualifier and he did it and he made it. He like I went and talked to him and just like I text you like he he just pulled up a little too much. Mm -hmm. He thought he needed a little more than what he really did, yep. and that's he kind of looped it out there. And then just the slap just sent him over the front. And yep. He was he was banged up. I mean, for the day he ended up having, for how beat up he was after that qualifier, like I'm super impressed. Yeah. So DJ DJ Sperling, his right hand man, there was on the show last week, but his, DJ told me yesterday, texted me and said, "Hey, like Jeffrey was a little busted up." So, um, yeah. and and yeah, like he had it, he had it. If if the front end wouldn't have been as high, but like he's jumping it for the first time, it's one of those jumps that's not necessarily built to be to be jumped, right? So those are like the faces that are harder to judge. And maybe Shane can touch on this, but. Um, and he said he's maybe not one of those guys that was was the guy to uh, send a jump for the first time or whatever. But Shane will be able to remember, like, just having that flow and being like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. You know, you get you get that feeling at times. So, Shane, I'll let you touch on that before we move on to the motos. Well, you do. I mean, sometimes you get that feeling and, and then there's other times your brain turns to shit. So <laughs> uh, and he, had, he had that jump made. I mean, if you look at it, his front end was just too high. Yeah. Uh, in the easiest way to tell, I mean, like Joel was telling Casey, you know, I want to know if anybody's jumping. The easiest way to tell if anyone's jumping is come by. There'll be a whole bunch of people standing there watching. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, something's up. so if there's not a bunch of people there, just keep going. So, yeah, I mean, that's impressive that he even tried it. Um, because, and here's the thing, that video, the rip it up video with Thomas jumping that thing, um, you know, that was that last year, year before, a couple of years ago. Yeah. The the track, I mean, it's even though the track is the same, the lip's different, the run's different. I mean, everything is different from year to year. I mean, who's to say that the, the lip was even the same and the run was the same and they, they, when they groomed the track? I mean, the you know, mm -hmm. the, the uh, jump that he was coming down on was in the same exact place. I mean, there's so many things that change year to year. It may look the same, but it's, it's not the same. But, mm -hmm. hey, 
he tried it. He's got big balls. I mean, if he pulled, <laughs> I would say someone else would have tried it. But probably the best thing happened. He wrecked, and everybody else left it alone. So. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, I do want to give a little credit to Tremell and Media House. He caught that video for us, and that was awesome. I had people messaging me uh, saying, you know, Jeffrey just tried the tunnel jump, and now he's down, and all these things. So to have um, to have Logan have caught the video there was pretty cool. Uh, okay, so let's get into the motos then. Um, the opening moto at High Point, you know, perfect day, perfect conditions greeted these riders, which was a welcome sight, obviously, after Aonia. And man, you couldn't have dreamt up a better start for Chad Weenan than that first moto. He rips the whole shot, and Joel Hetrick is in about fifth. So obviously, things are looking good for Chad at this point. What were you thinking when you saw where these two key players were at the start of that moto, Shane? I mean, for me, um, I know I posted at the start of this thing right after the whole shot, like we're going to have a race on our hands here with the way that this played out. So Shane, I'll let you touch on that. Well, I stood in the tower. I was in the tower with Casey and yeah. when the, um, Joel got, or uh, Chad got, people were an awesome start. And I thought well, that's, that's pretty good. And then I look and Joel was in fifth and he got banged up a little bit about the second turn. And <laughs> I thought, uh, you know, he's in fifth or sixth, but it's a long moto, you know. I mean, the guys that's in front of Joel aren't as fast as Joel and definitely don't got the experience. Um, so, I'm too worried about Joel getting second. And then he got with uh, Hogue or somebody, they got together, and he all but went down. He almost went on his head. So, but he, but he saved it. And then he got back. And when he got to second, I thought, well, he'll catch Chad, but, you know, you know, catching Chad and passing Chad's going to be different. But yeah. Joel – just uses some different lines and his corner speed is just it's unreal he backs the thing into the corners if, if you watch it, some of the corners i mean chad drives it down and turns and drives off and joel is completely you got that thing turns and headed the other direction while chad is still going straight and um, he's just killing with corner speed yeah so, and on, on those conditions right on on those you know blue groove like conditions joel's just so good and off cameras i mean that track itself high point has always been one of those tracks that joel is just so special on but even even so um you know like i said i knew it was prepping i knew it was lining up to be a good race but man what we saw from joel going forward just how quickly the tables turned i think was and, and we'll get into this more as we go here but it was like unlike anything we've really seen in the Chad Weenan era. I don't want to overstate it, but man, I was, I was still surprised on what we saw going forward there. Yeah. I mean, he passed Chad easier than he did the other guys. I was shocked. I mean, as soon as he caught Chad, he went right by him. I'm like, well, that ruined that race. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he got out front and I thought, well, I mean, Chad's got to try to, to, you know, to see what, see some different lines and see what Joel's doing. But he just pulled away so quick that really Chad didn't have time to even see anything. Chad tried a couple different lines right as soon as he got by him to pass him, but they they weren't any good. And then that let Joel gap him four or five, six bike lengths. And by that time, it was they were they were just spread out. And you know, basically, Chad was just going to ride around, and take a second. So yeah, uh, I mean, they're both two of the fastest guys out there, and 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 the rest of the guys, if, if conditions are like they was, conditions were perfect on on Saturday. Um, I don't know if you could better i mean but the, but high point is a it's a highway i mean it's kind of like um red bud some of those tracks i mean you've got to you got to get up on it and get after it it's not like you know it's a county or, or somewhere that's really got a bunch of different grooves it's rough i mean it's it's a hard packed track and and uh joel gets in and out of the corners just better than anybody and that's just that's just simple i mean he doesn't i mean he you know, you, these guys go to these motocross races and they think it's the guy, they think the jumps and the whoops and the stuff like this. It's not what wins the races. It's the corners. Yeah, I mean, we were in the tower, and you're so far away, you couldn't really tell, but it's just he 
his jump just wasn't good. I mean, and he pretty much explained that. And it was interesting, I think, for me to see. I wanted to see what he could do without getting a start. And, like, watching the parade lap starts, Joel's start looked really good, but Chad's angle into that first turn was well better than what I thought Joel's was. I think gate pick selection was one of the keys in Chad Wienan's start there, and he just put himself in a really good position, and he, I mean, he just shot out of that thing like a cannon, and I was like, oh, boy, and he was rolling. I mean, I was like, okay. You know, and it, it's like Shane said, I mean, we knew he could get himself into second, but Chad had such a big gap so quick that I was like, wow, that's going to be pretty tough. And then it's the same thing. Once you catch Chad, it's like you don't just catch him and go around him. And, I, you know, we were announcing that, you know, during the race. I'm like, okay, yeah, like he's closing in. But uh, for a little bit, he wasn't making up these huge gaps. And then it was like all of a sudden he got into some clear track or found his groove. And, and it just – the gap was gone and he was by him. I was really excited to see those two go at it on a racetrack like we had. I mean, the high point circuit was insane this weekend. So I'm thinking, oh, we're going to get some really good battles, you know, guys cutting short, cutting under each other, and we're going to have this gnarly race. And it was like, it was a no big deal. He just went right by and it was like, see you later. I'm like, wow, what, you know, it was insane. <laughs> well, he, he, we we was in a tower, so we couldn't see exactly where he made it. But he, he where he made up all the time was coming down a downhill, and then you turn right and you come up to the finish line. So they dropped over the hill and started down the downhill. So they go out of your sight, and you know you figure at the bottom of the hill, ever there's going to be one good groove. Well, Joel apparently went to the inside, and then Chad went to the outside off the berm. And when they started up the hill, they were side by side. And uh, when they hit the that uphill triple right before you turn left into the finish line. Joel pretty much just jumped right in front of him. And I thought, wow, I didn't, I didn't expect that. But yeah. uh, I mean, so you, you, you could see him coming up the hill. And soon as they hit the triple, you could see Joel was right beside him already. And I thought, man, he got a lot of drive because I mean, that's an off camber right hand turn down there. Mm -hmm. So you know, without going down looking at it, I'm assuming that the outside had a berm and that's probably where Chad went. And then Joel turned to the inside, but Joel probably come down and, and, and come back across cut back across you know because his i mean he back he had to back it in down there there's a couple different places you could see from the tower really well where chad would come down and turn in and um and joel i mean he's got the bike completely sideways three or four bike lengths before why chad's still going straight sure um he's just more comfortable riding like that it's he's just got a different riding style and, and he moves around and finds different lines and and uh, i mean even though he rides sideways like that you know if he, if he hooks a rut, he's going to flip, but mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't, you know, I mean, Jeremiah was, was, was known for that. Jeremiah was always sideways and I, I'd follow Jeremiah and I'm like, this kid just wrecked 15 times this lap and he's still on the bike. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, like the way Joe rides, I mean, he's, he's sideways, but he gets turned and he gets back across the corner incredibly fast and, 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 uh, and no one else does it. So. Yeah, so so a couple years ago when Joel and Joel, yeah, again, he's been amazing on those conditions. He always has been. He's he's the best of the best in those conditions. Um, a couple years ago when he signed with CST, and I had been with CST for a couple of years at that point, and I knew that the CST tire, the Pulse MXR, that soft compound rear, and the crown of the front tires 
they're the best in those conditions that I knew it was going to make for even a more dangerous combo for Joel on these kind of conditions. So I think that that helps him to start that corner earlier than, than the rest of them. I really think that that works in his, his favor. Um, so, so Casey, you've been around for like the entirety of Joel Hetrick's professional career, a career that includes a hundred moto wins, something that he accomplished at the previous event. But I asked this on social media, I kind of touched on it already, um, but I did ask this on social media in the wake of literally this unbelievable performance was this the best performance of Joel Hetrick's career because I, I truly have been wrestling with that thought here uh the last couple of days since we saw this on Saturday yeah it's tough I mean I've seen so many of his races so it's hard to really say and this one obviously is fresh and it was nothing nothing shy of incredible so I mean you could argue that it definitely is one of the best performances he he would probably say no there's something else, you know, somewhere along the lines, you know, where he made up more positions or whatever. But I think it was just showing what he, you know, he just, he just knew like the comfort level with him all day. He was, you know, super happy with his machine. You know, he, the power was there. Everything was working and clicking for him. He had a really good fan base there. And I think, you know, all those things click for you and you go out and you ride like that. I mean, it, there's only so much you can say in, in that sense. And like, you know, me and Shane or Shane and I were up in the tower and we didn't get to see the pass. If it wasn't for a couple of guys videos, like I would have no idea how we made the pass. And it was, I mean, it was just textbook. I mean, they, they just come in that corner and he just exactly what Shane said. I mean, he, he's backing it in and it does come down to some of the tire thing. Like you're talking about when we went to like the Maxis Razor plus, the back and it in corners ends up kind of went away because of the way the tire works where you see some guys with those tires, they're driving those tires around the corners. And that's what Chad does where with Joel with on the CSTs, that tire slides a little better, has a little less side bite say where he, he can back it in the corners and pull those moves off. And when you get on a track like high point, you can do that all day long. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And like I said, what stood out to me, and, and we'll move on from this because I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but how rapidly the race changed and how the, the tides turned so fast is what blew my mind. Um, we've just, we've never really seen this before. And, and again, not to overstate it, but we've never seen this before with Chad Wienan involved. And uh, Joel was just in a league of his own on this day. So uh, Moto2 comes and right off the bat, we see Hogue and Restrelli down in the first turn. And what I didn't know, and I touched on this already that I talked to DJ Sperling yesterday from Rocket Machining and Design, who's obviously an integral part of Jeffrey's program. We heard from him last week, but what I didn't know at the time was Jeffrey's intake had come off in the first moto. So the crew decided to swap motors uh, to be safe after ingesting dirt in that first moto. And when we got the, when they got the motor changed, the thing wouldn't start. So after troubleshooting it a little bit, the 10 minute the staging horn is going off. Everybody's heard that horn before that hard blows. So they decide, you know, we're not going to be able to, to fix this thing or figure it out. We're going to have to jump the solenoid, which obviously would have been totally fine unless he stalls the engine at any point. So obviously it is in, inevitably as fate would have it, he goes down in the first corner. Jeffrey doesn't realize that he can legally get assistance in the first corner up to the line. That's legal. Um, so uh, DJ's trying to help him. Jeffrey's still unsure, you know, that he's able to do this. He says F that and, and gives the thing a push. And thankfully it starts, which makes the impressive ride that he would put on that much more impressive. But what did you see, uh, of that first corner um, kind of melee with, with Restrelli and Hogue there. Did you see that in the second model? Casey? Yeah, for sure. And I, as soon as I seen that he was down, I knew that his starter button wasn't working. And I was like, oh boy. And I'm like, hopefully he remembers. Like, you know, because the adrenaline's going and everything. And, it, and that's just one of those cases where one person breaks a little too much or not too much, but one person breaks and someone doesn't break enough or whatever. And they end up in a big carnage mess like that. And, it's so hard to even tell what happened, like, when you're watching it live. I'm sure we could go back and dissect videos and see what went on there. But, yeah, I mean, Jeffrey made the right decision. He's trying to get it around the corner so he could get it bumped, started down the hill. DJ's trying to make the right decision to run up there to help him because he knows. But at the same time, he's, you know, Jeffrey's still facing or still on a hill anyways. He could have almost come right back down the starting line and got it to fire, too. Um, he lost a monumental amount of time there in that mess. You know, Brandon got up and got out of there just a little bit quicker than he did. And, you know, 
Brandon wrote awesome. You know, it, one guy that we didn't really get to touch really much on yet is Bryce Ford. I mean, kind of like quiet rides, but super solid. Like, yes, yes. Put, he put himself in really good positions, you know, really good start first moto, really good start second moto, and rode exceptionally well. But I just felt like I, I know how Bryce rides, and I, he had, I think he had more in the tank. It was just trying to figure it out where his comfort was. And, you know, but, yeah, I mean, Jeffrey, Brandon, you know, the results they pulled in the second moto coming from that far back was really good. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. So Bryce got that third in the first moto and yeah, there was, there was a number of guys that stood out, you know, Jeffrey was one of the guys too. So after a strong fourth in that first moto, so he crosses the line 30 seconds behind the next closest rider, you know, he, he lost a lot of time yeah. there in that whole deal in the first corner. And so he puts on a charge from 15th to seventh, where he would be the fastest rider on the track for the late stages of this race, which is incredible. Um, and, and Shane, you've been to a number of these races over the years. This is isn't the same Jeffrey Rastrelli that we've seen in, in, you know, recent years, Shane, this is, uh, this is awesome to see. We've been on these shows, you know, praising Jeffrey. I, that's why I wanted to kind of get your, your um, opinion on it, because, you know, again, you've been at a number of these things and this is a new Jeffrey this year, a Jeffrey we haven't seen in, in a while. He he's really, really, really stepped it up this year. Yeah. He, he actually looks better. He looks, he must be more focused um, cause he's riding really well. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I think he's, he's getting up there to, to, you know, not a young kid anymore. Um, and he's been good forever. It just seems like he's kind of hit and miss. He'll run a good race and then a bad race, but he's been pretty solid. Um, he kind of look at him and through his whole career, he's, he's kind of been battling with Joel, um, kind of sucks, you know, cause, I mean, no one wanted to grow, wanted to grow up racing with Joe every week. So <laughs> exactly. had to do that. So he's been at, overshadowed, um, but he's always been really good. And, and he rode good at high point. And, um, and I, I raced with his dad. His dad was actually pretty good too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, Know that, know that but his dad was really good mm -hmm. yeah um, I, I shared a video of of jeff last weekend at uh, i think it was high point no 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 it was steel city 06 uh shared a, a video of jeff in the in the vet class and um yeah it's just it's awesome to see i just I, like you said, I think you touched on a good point there that Jeffrey's been, you know, he's unfortunately had to race Joel all these years, but he's really strong in, in his own right. And we've been saying on these shows now that he's doing more of his own program, uh, I think that you can just see, I mean, there's more desire, there's more fight, there's more motivation there for Jeffrey. And I think that that's coming out in his riding. Well, I think at some point, you know, he's got to, I mean, these are going to be his best years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really got to take it serious and, and get after it. I mean, he's got the talent, you know, he's got, he's got the backing. I mean, he's, he's got good family backing and he's got good sponsors and stuff. So if he's going to do it, he needs to do it. I mean, it's an uphill climb. I mean, he's got two, two really good guys in front of him. I mean, both got championships and don't, neither one of them seem to be slowing down. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's, it's going to be tough, but yeah, I mean, I would hate to think that I had to grow up and race my whole career against Joel. So, <laughs> Right. Kind of right. One of the all time greats. Exactly. Um, the other rider in that melee in the first corner was Brandon Hogue. He put on a show as well. He clawed his way up from 14th to sixth, uh, but he would, he was never going to catch that next rider um, who's actually going to be this next guest of ours, Nick Janusa, uh, an impressive fifth in Moto2, fifth overall on the day. And most importantly, the strongest day of the 2022 season so far for him. Let's get to Nick Janusa right here to talk about a solid day for him at High Point. All right, guys, this next guest is one of my favorites. Every time he joins the podcast, I've really come to enjoy this guy brought to you by our friends at Integrated Financial Concepts and their safe to race and safe to ride insurance programs. Mike Danielli is the man at Integrated Financial Concepts. He's also this rider's right hand man. Say hello to Mr. Nick Janusa. Nick, welcome back to the podcast, man. Thanks so much for being here. Anytime, man. It's always a pleasure to come on here. And, uh, you know, I enjoy stuff like this. It's definitely different to get involved on this side of things in the sport. And uh, it's the least I can do is give a little bit of my time, especially at, uh, what are we, nine o'clock Monday night. <laughs> definitely got nothing going on at this time. There you go. Yeah, I told you, um, you know, usually I like to push these back a little bit 
later into the week, typically like I would love to get the shows out right away, but I know how crazy things are when you get home and there's a zillion things to do and cleaning and prep and whatever. Um, but yeah, we're scheduling around some stuff this week. So uh, hammering, th hammering things out early. So I appreciate you fitting it in. Uh, so dude, tell me about your weekend. By far the strongest showing of 2022 so far for you. Uh, you were even near the top in qualifying, which isn't necessarily the norm for you. Obviously, like it looked like you were feeling it right from the jump this weekend. Yeah, I mean, uh, man, I don't really know exactly where to start with this. Uh, I, I'm hard on myself with stuff like this, and I always compare myself to a better version of myself, and a better version of myself was last year, 2021, and looking at how that year went, you know, I started strong, and I ran third in points all last year, and had a couple of mechanical failures and crashes that definitely, you know, I did it to myself at the end, but I compare myself to last year. So if I look at this past weekend as a fifth, that was a very medium finish for last year. And it's crazy me thinking, you know, if I were to put myself in April, May, where we are now to thinking the fourth round, it took me to get to a top five is, uh, it's stressful. It's, it's taken a toll on me. And, um, uh, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy. I can't not be happy with it. I'm happy that it's my best finish of the season, but I, uh, I got to make some more work with uh, what I have to, you know, I, it's kind of hard to put it into words. I just, uh, I want to stay positive about it and keep growing. I, I got nothing negative to say about it, but um, you know, we've had bad weather at two of the races, definitely a factor, um, especially when you're not, always up there on the starts like people know I'm not um makes it even harder in a bad weather race so I try to wipe those two off but you know as a competitive guy it gets to you when you have bad races so it's been a really rough start and that's just part of it you know I think that's some of it though right is is at least in my mind like evaluating your season so far when two of those races are in the conditions that they were so you're like person slotted in it doesn't matter I mean there's tons of good dudes that aren't finishing you know are, are, aren't getting great starts right and all of you are just I mean you were finishing exactly where you started basically in both of those races you started third you finished third if a person started fifth you finished fifth this person started seventh you finished seventh and so like it's hard to evaluate those races um you, you know what I mean? Like you could have easily been Absolutely. top five in those races, right? And you just ended up being sixth or whatever, or seventh. And it's like, how do you, I mean, I don't Absolutely. think, I don't think of that as a strike against you. Um, I don't know. It's, just, it's tough. And, and yes, like I understand as a competitor where you're, you're, you're looking at the calendar, it's May 2nd. You just got done finishing your first top five of the year. At the same time, like, I feel like, you know, it's hard to evaluate that. And all of a sudden, man, you could click, you could click, like, tell me physically where you are. So that's how I would, I would evaluate it. Like, could you, do you feel like you could go out and get podiums, you know, like at, at these races all of a sudden, and then you string a few of those together and you're on your best stretch of the year. Like maybe that's only a few weeks away, you know, or, or yeah. I'm sorry, like your best stretch of your career is what I meant to say. Yeah. Racing, you know, I'll always give credit. You know, I might not see eye to eye with all the guys I race with, but I respect the the group I race with because I think as a competitive level we have a really really solid group of racers that are very talented um I'll never not look at it like that I came into Daytona as strong as I could have um you know I came in very similar to how I did last year and you have weather thrown out you like that it changes everything you know skipping ahead to Texas no excuse there. I mean, I, I love that track. I thought it was awesome. We had great weather. Um, I was off my game. Uh, Georgia, I'm, I'm really disappointed in Georgia because that track looks so darn fun and on Friday when the amateurs are riding. The guy did a great job on the racetrack, and we just had weather like that hit us, and it was, man, it was, I don't even know how to put that, just a totally different type of race that was not what I watched, what the track was going to be, and then last but not least high point over the weekend another great track it was looking like and we had good weather and it ended up being a great track and mm -hmm. um uh, it's it, it's tough I mean thinking about it now I mean this last re race over the weekend my dad came and he's been completely out of the mix respectfully and mm -hmm. 
what I've been dealing with at home the last six months is, is heavy. You know, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, obviously I'm very thankful my dad's still here, but when you have a very massive stroke, like he has, he's not the same. He's not, he can't see out of his left eye. He's not driving anymore. He's not working. Um, we're a very close family. I'm one of four. Mm-hmm. We have a lot going on. And when you take the man of the house out, a lot changes. And, you know, from a racing standpoint, um, it's very, very, very difficult to balance a professional career without, Mm -hmm. it's not even, it's not even the support, you know, like financial support is always great to have, you know, my old man always got me to the races was huge. But to not have him go to the races with me, be there on race day, and to think, you know, I, I want to say to think I was, I didn't overlook this, like, thinking about it now in October when he had the stroke, I was like, man, I'm, I'm done racing. Like, I, I can't do this without him. Then a month goes by. I got to figure it out. I'm 26 years old. I'm not 16. I got to do this on my own. Um, and I made some changes into my program and had a lot of people step up and I'm thankful for all the sponsors that stepped up and people that got involved, but you know, it's, uh, it's tough. It's, it's not the same with my dad not coming to the races and with, uh, I just, you don't know what it's like, you know, your, your dad. And and it's like funny because when you're a kid and your, your dad's always saying you at the races, you know, you'll realize what I did for you when you're gone. You kind of, you don't, no, until yep. they're really not there anymore and he did a lot and it was it was really uh humbling the first couple of races and I think it was like stress of not having him there number one um you know the stuff I take on at home now we could talk into that and <laughs> you might think I'm throwing excuses at you but no. when I tell you that I feel like my racing's gotten 40 percent of me this year Mm-hmm. Uh, I've I've only been able to give it 40 or 50 percent and it shows and it's not by choice at all well so so Nick I mean a lot of the reason why I wanted to talk to you was I mean because I wanted to I wanted to be able to talk to you on a weekend where like I, I felt like it was good right like a top yeah. five was awesome um that was the next thing on my or one of the next things on my list was to talk about how gnarly the class is right now so you kind of touched on that but I did want to shed some light on the stuff that you're dealing with in your personal life, because like, yes, like from afar, I could tell that obviously things had totally changed for you. You know, obviously like at this point in your career, you know, top, you know, you, so you get this top five, right. And I know that you're at the point in your career and you kind of hinted at this already that, you know, you're not going to be jumping at for joy at top fives and that that hasn't changed in the last couple of years. Um, but we know like with all the stuff going on in your personal life, I, you know, I was kind of curious, like, did it make, you know, does it make getting a top five? It's a small success, but it's better than what has, you know, the other races have been so far this season. Like that was one of my questions was, does it make that any sweeter? But I I don't even almost want to, I mean, that's, that's not as important to me as touching on the fact that, you know, I can't relate with you. Um, I, I don't know how it feels to be you, but I can, you know, you and I grew up kind of racing around the same time. We raced Pro-Am together. We raced, you know, I watched you and your dad. You were, I think I was maybe like, you're a tick younger than me. So I was on a 450 when you were on the, you know, the mini bike stuff. And I was watching all that. And I've been, I've watched you and your dad for forever. And if you, you know, and, and I'm the same way as you, you know, you, you think at the racetrack, like you're a big prideful guy, you're, you're Nick Janusa, you're a top five pro, you're a podium pro and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, if you took my, you know, my dad away from even my race program, even as an amateur, um, it just changes everything is because that was like, he's my comfort zone. You know, he's my, you know, he, there's stuff I wouldn't even have to think about. Like, do I think, you know, long and hard about, you know, bike setup or, or gate pick or whatever. And, you know, you just respect, you respect that man's opinion so much. And I know you feel the exact same way. I'm watching you nod your head here, but just all those little things where he takes a, that stress off you and you respect his 
opinion so much. And he's, again, just like that shoulder to lean on as you, you know, deal with adversity throughout your racing and whatever. Um, again, I, I'm not saying it as I know how that feels, but I think I could know, you know, I can see how that would feel because if you stole my dad from my race program and my race day, and I always said that, like, I don't know that I would do it without him just because that's what we've always bonded over. Obviously, like I, I can tell you, know, you just don't want to punt on your racing. This is what you've done your whole life. You know, you want to figure it out. I, I, I would have, I'm sure I would have made the same decision, but I know what you're saying where it's like, it's never going to be the same. And you're trying to figure out this new normal. I think that that's kind of what you're getting at. And you're in the process of juggling all this stuff and trying to race against the baddest dudes in the world and be one of them and mix it up as you're trying to figure out what this new normal is. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a bunch of things to touch on there. The thing I've struggled a little bit with recently is balance and balance of, uh, how to balance certain things in your life and then be able to flick that switch on race day. Very difficult. Um, another thing you just touched on, uh, when my father, your father, they take a lot of stress. They, they, fathers can add stress. We all know that, but fathers take off a lot of stress more than you think on race day. You know, I think if you look at the pro class or if you really look at any of the amateur racing, 90% of the people there are doing it with their dad. Um, you know, if I raced without my dad my whole career, I, that would have been all I knew. But this is what we did. You know, I've been going to the races since I was eight years old. I'll be 27 in four weeks. Like, this is what we did all these years. And now take him out for the first time in my entire life. And uh, it's tough, you know, and going back to the, the chaos in my life. And, I, you know, I could spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to try to sum it up real, relatively quick. Um, you know, the old man does a lot around the house. He's not driving anymore. He can't go and do errands. I'm the guy of the house. Now I'm doing all that. I'm one of four. Like I said, I'm the only guy in this house. So I've taken on a lot at home without, and I don't want to sound like I'm complaining about it at all. I have no problem helping out around the house. Never did. Um, but that's another thing added to my plate. i have a property with my track on it right now that's been a blessing to have um i've been going through building my house um it's been taking way too long uh two and a half years i've owned the property i've been building a house for two years so i started the construction out of pocket up front and then i finally got a loan in october so this is really where a lot of my life's flipped which most people don't know because i probably never really said too much about it so i um took a little while to get it construction loan on my house I finally got it in October when you get a construction loan on a house to finish you have x amount of time to finish because you can't you know you can't borrow funds for a very long time and drag your project out right so my dad um had built houses a long time ago you so he was going to help be the GC on my house help move the project along as he's guiding me through you know my first house mm -hmm. and um Three weeks after I got the loan, he has a stroke. Now I'm left to finish his house with no uh, no experience at all. I mean, I, I listen. I'm not I'm not stupid. I definitely have the street smarts. Um, but if you've never done anything like that, it, it's it's quite difficult to say at the least. It's probably been, especially in the state of New Jersey, it's probably been the most difficult task I've ever done in my life. Um, because I've, I've never done it before. I'm sheer proof of winging it. Um, I mean, it, don't get me wrong. It's very legitimate, the whole house, this of and course. that, but it's yep. very stressful. I'm my own GC on my house and I will be the first to tell you that is damn near a full-time thing. And that has taken all of my time. There's no secret. So balance. So what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to stop the house? and continue racing which would probably help my racing mm -hmm. but at the same time how long can i drag my feet on my house which is really the the long game to have it's not a temporary home i plan to stay there a very long time mm -hmm. if not forever um you know or, or vice versa you know come out of racing and get my life together and, and maybe come back to racing in a year i'd be lying if i said i didn't think about it i was two or three rounds in 
and I talked it over with my family and I was very close to pulling out this year. Very close, not based off of my finishes so much, but based off of, I cannot juggle these things because my house yeah. project's a mess. I have people that are barely showing up to work. Yeah. It, it requires all my time. And now I got to flick the switch coming in this race weekend. My racing is getting 50% of me. You have all these sponsors that invest in you and you're literally not showing half of what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I thought about it for a few days. I was pretty set that I got to come out, finish this year, get on my feet, come back. And then I just woke up a few weeks back and I'm like, I just, because I was set on come out, um, told I'm checked out of the season, two or three rounds in, done. Mm -hmm. And I woke up and I couldn't physically stop myself from getting ready to go train that day because that's all I know. What it's do? what you know, like my tracks at the same property where my house is. So I'm loading my quad up literally at 6 37 in the morning to meet these contractors, and my quad sits in the back of my truck till um like three o'clock until when two three o'clock when i'm moto and um i i just i i just started getting ready like what are you doing i thought you were done i'm just my but my my inner heart is just, i'm not i, I gotta figure this out and i got a million things i'm watching on not even looking for it but just right time you're on social media and you see these videos pop up and it, you know life ain't easy it's it's how you balance it and I've come to the conclusion that I have to finish the two. I'm going to be the best version of me in my racing right now of what I'm dealing with. Um, and I don't want to sound negative. There's, it's really none of it's overly negative in my life. It's just a lot to take on because I didn't have any of this last year. Mm -hmm. Zero of these uh, other things added to my plate. Right. Um, so I, I've been doing the best I can to manage it. And then, you know, having my dad come because it's only five or six hours away was such a big motivator to me. And I can't tell you how excited I was. And mind you, when you have a, he, he's, he's not as hands-on anymore, um, mm -hmm. but he, he knows what's going on. He's talking, he's walking and talking, getting around, but yep. he was just there. He was just presence was there on race day. And I was just so motivated to know when I go out time qualifier one and two that my dad's there, you know, and it's, uh, yeah. I was just, I was on it and it was, it was probably like 75% of me was back. Like my heart's all there right now. My physical's all there, but like, I wasn't as sharp that little bit because I physically haven't been able to mm -hmm. put it there. You know, I know it's a lot yeah. to take in what I'm saying and I'll stop it here. No, no, man, yeah. you're good. Like I, that was why it was so important. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know specifics, right? Like I just knew what, what you've, you know, your family has dealt with and, and the tragedy, thankfully, it, you know, I, I hate to say it wasn't worse, but thankfully yeah. it wasn't worse. Right. You know, you got a, a person's got to have them. Right. A person's got to count their blessings. But at the same time, I knew that you giving some context to, you know, what's going on was going to help narrate like the way your season has been so far. It was going to make your fifths more impressive. It was going to make the other, like the other stuff, you know, almost still like more impressive to me at least, you know, because the more stuff you have going on around, you know, in the back of your mind or whatever. And like you said, you use the word chaos. I think you used the word chaos in a post earlier today. And that's so hard to silence that when, cause just like you said, you're trying to flip the switch and go be a killer on race day. And that's nearly impossible when you have all that other stuff going on. So the one thing I would like to, to, to ask you, because, you know, I think in so many different sports, especially in ours, you've seen people, you know, it's harder at your level, right? You're at the very, you're at the best of the best. You're at the tip of the spear. I understand that. But is there any way that a person can make it so, you know, that the race day can almost be like a getaway to where that's your one place where, you know, you can't you, being like that day, the house stuff doesn't matter that day. The, the home stuff doesn't matter that day, all the, crap that you deal with all the hurdles all that stuff is it, you know what i mean do you get yeah. that feeling at all like you're almost free at the racetrack at least when you're on your quad and maybe maybe that can be your little bit of extra 
wind at your back or wind in your sails on race day? Is there any chance that that happens? Yeah, I think, I think one escapes the other. Um, sure. I've, I've been enjoying, you know, I, I hated my house project for like six months straight. It was the cheerily the death of me, but Mm -hmm. I'm so close right now. Like I'm going in the morning and they're sheetrocking tomorrow. Like I'm very close. I'm probably eight weeks away from moving in. Awesome. But looking at it from the getaway standpoint, yes and no. You know, I like to shoot stuff right as it is. And, and uh, Nick, I, I hope you weren't thinking I was minimizing because that wasn't it at all. I was just, not you know, all. just spitballing here, right? Yep. No, no, I like it. So I think it's a definitely a getaway from that side of things. Like coming into the weekend, all oh, my dad's coming, got good weather, tracks looking good. Like it was cool to be back, but there's always that pressure of this counts. This isn't a race, you know, for fun. Don't get me wrong. They're all fun, but this isn't, I know what you mean. You know, this, this is what the sponsors invest in you for. This is what you're getting paid to do. This is what matters. And you, you also are, point. you also are putting that pressure on yourself because you have your own standard. Yeah. Um, but that's how I am. That's nothing new. I've always been like that. Like I, mm -hmm. I want a racing race day to get 110% of me every time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you, you got a point. I mean, it's definitely has, it has its feeling of, you know, like a step back and it's tough to come into these weekends sometime and be a hundred percent on, but I, I really got like a, a, I thought I had like a taste of it. The last three prior races, like I'm back just how I felt 2021, mm -hmm. but over the weekend when I tasted it again, I'm like, no, no, like that's what it feels like to, to be back in the mix. And now I have like a smell of blood again mm -hmm. and just easily motivated where I was forcing myself to go riding where I was forcing myself to train that day sure you know two days back from this event I mean I was grooming my track this morning I'm ready to go tomorrow mm -hmm. just effortlessly just I want it again and that's uh and that's what it takes and yeah at times you have to go through very you know dark times is as dark as it might not seem to people you know I leave a lot of stuff out but it's it's been tough because it, I'm hard on myself and it weighs on me and I'm human too. I'm a pro racer. I race pro class. We sign autographs Saturday, but I'm a normal person the other six days too. You know, I, I'm a human being and I, I have feelings and emotion and yeah. it's, uh, I love, I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, times like this are tough to balance. And I couldn't imagine, uh, I couldn't imagine like having kids right now in the mix or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that I don't yeah. want kids, but it's, uh, I give credit when people have it and, and keep going. Yeah. You know, I think that that's such a big part of it that you touched on that, that, you know, you're a professional athlete, just like all other professional athletes, but just like all other professional athletes, you deal with stuff too. And I think that that's why I, you know, that's why I think stuff like this show, stuff like digging deep stuff, like, you know, giving some context to what you're dealing with, Instead of just, you know, somebody see, seeing the results sheet and seeing, you know, fourth and qualifying six, five for fifth overall, oh, Nick's back in the top five. Well, Nick's back in the top five, dealing with all this other stuff, feeling like he's not sharp, you know, not being able to focus on just his riding and his training, dealing with all that other stuff. I think that that's important to be able to kind of, you know, because not making excuses, not, you know, not, not, um, you know, not taking pressure off yourself, not saying that you're not prioritizing, none of that. It's just, I think, at least for me, like my favorite athletes are athletes that go through shit and that come yeah. out on the other side and, and, you know, that, you know, they become better because of it. Right. And, and I know you're yeah, the I same mean, way. Listen, it's, uh, I'm glad we got to talk on this. Um, I feel like I needed to sh shine a little bit of light on it to, because I'm sure people have been wondering like, man, what the heck's this guy's deal? But, um, you know, I, I'm not one to make huge excuses. I don't really like to make, I, I'll always put the blame on myself with stuff, but I'm not going to complain about it over social media, but I deal with a lot outside the racing scene. And a lot of people probably don't know the, you know, the stuff at home or the building my own house stuff. Like I don't, I don't even think I've ever posted a picture of my house. I'm not, 
It's not really anyone's business. Not that it's no one's business, but I, I'm low key about stuff like that. But, you know, that's what I got going on. And I'm telling you, that's a full time thing in itself. But if no one moves that project, it never happens. You know what I mean? I, I'd be staying at home forever. Right. And it's got to get moved by somebody. And I'm the guy right now. And it's uh, it's tough. I mean, it's 30 minutes away from where I live now. I do the not that it's crazy far, but it's not like it's around the corner. It adds up. Time adds up. Yeah. Oh, I've driven there like 400 times. <laughs> right. No, I know exactly how it goes. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, I, I, I didn't, I don't want this whole conversation to have this heavy feel, right? So um, let's end it, you know, kind of looking forward. So you, you know, got this top five, you're obviously building at this point. I, oh, yeah. you know, I think that, I think that truly at high point, we saw the Nick Janusa that we know, we saw the Nick Janusa we know for the, for the first time kind of in 2022, it was like, I don't know if it was just getting out in clean air or, or like you said, having that momentum of, you know, the good vibes of having your dad at the track, all those things. So how do you build on that going forward? I mean, Ironman is next. Like I love Crawfordsville. I love it being back on the schedule, you know, thoughts on, on Ironman and kind of using this momentum, um, you know, to kind of push you going forward. Yeah, truly, I don't want to shed any negativity on what I'm going through. I believe I'm a strong believer of everything in life happens for a reason. You have to go yep. through some things to become the person that you ought to be one day. And as much as it's just killing me right now, I'm I'm definitely growing. And it's hard to admit it sometimes because I I'm thick, got thick skin with stuff, but I know it's helping me grow. And um uh, you know, even with high point, I, I, that was just a prime example of, it's not even that I had great starts. My second moto start was almost great until I avoided a wreck in the first turn and came out bad, but I made quick moves and it was, uh, I don't, I mean, very respectfully, it was easy for me to come through the pack fast. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't even overly thinking it and I made quick moves and I, I just felt back, uh, back where I was and it, I needed just like a taste. I needed like just something to regroup. I needed my dad to show up I needed and my mom was with them yep. um, I needed just that you know and looking forward at Ironman I think Ironman's a great track but um, I'm crossing my fingers it doesn't rain because I feel like every time <laughs> we went there it's raining every like, time, yeah. like every single time yep. and it's such a cool place um, and it's hard pack the track and mm -hmm. man I don't know I really like these hard pack tracks mm -hmm. and I seem to do decently well at them you know Briarcliff it was hard pack yep. and I can promise you I ride nothing even close to that at that all sand. You, think be, you think I'd be doing better at these sand tracks <laughs> because that's literally all I ride right and I do better at these hard pack tracks and I don't know if the sand is actually making me a better clay rider because when I get to the clay it's just so much easier to me and I, I don't know it's like it's interesting to think about I, I'm trying to ask myself but yeah I, I'm excited to finish the, this second half of the season and see what I can do, because I truly think if I can put myself in a good spot, you know, even with a top five, again, this might be the most rewarding season to me to know what it's been. Um, and I don't want to say it, even if I don't, because I don't like to look at it like that. It, it's even, it's when I get a top five, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it'll be more re rewarding for me and I'm going to do what it takes. And it's, probably going to be the most difficult season in the last eight years with the combination of my personal life but I will also credit the other half towards the group of riders we have right now they're they're good mm -hmm. the whole oh, yeah. uh the top group you know it's it's not really the top five anymore it's like the top seven mm -hmm. and two more guys in the mix that could get a third you know like you look at Max Lindquist over the weekend who got seventh and then got third. Right. So like the first moto, he was behind me. And I think I pulled away for whatever. It doesn't matter how many seconds mm -hmm. left him. And then the second moto, he was ahead of me. And he stayed ahead of Bryce and pulled on me. And I'm like, was it him that stepped up? Or was it me that was a little bit off? But I, I'm, and I'm giving credit to him because yeah. Yeah. that is the that is the group of riders we're in right now. You can literally get a third or a seventh, you know, the Chad and Joel show will mm -hmm. seems like it's remaining the Chad and Joel show. Mm -hmm. um, but to have third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, that's five. Yeah. That's uh, that's a pretty big mix up of guys for one position. 
Oh, it's gnarly, dude. It's gnarly, it's gnarly. to have it be on to have it be unpredictable. Yeah. And, and to you, for you to have done this now for seven or eight years, that was, you know, I, it's crazy to think, you know, so you saw all these, all these eras in like, I, or the, all these kind of, you know, not, not eras, but you know what I mean? Like all these different versions of that top yeah. five, right. You've been a part of, we know the stat you've been, you know, top five every year, blah, blah, blah. You've seen that. And that's why I was like, you know, Nick, Nick's going to tell me that, that this class is as tough as any of them. Yeah. Another, you know, looking at it that way, that, that third place spot is like 80 or 90% whole shot. In my opinion, you know, you look at, um, and this is not calling out any single rider, but you look at, we could start with Ford who's in third right now in points. He's a great starter. He's always starting up front. He's going to get a lot of thirds. You put someone like Max Lindquist who came out second in that second moto, he's going to get the third. Australia with good starts this year got the third um i have not gotten a good start so i can't put myself up there with that but my Briarcliff last race last season third i came out third and i got third um where were we last i mean last race was a motor total right but but when you look at how close you guys are in speed that's where the whole shot's everything that's the one tiebreaker right that's exactly right that's the one tiebreaker like i said 80 to 90 percent if you both come out like two guys and they're uh, you know, one of those contenders, you have three, you're, you're in for a battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're starting in, out of the top 10, very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think, um, I think we have an exciting group. I, mean, I don't know how it looks from the sidelines, but it's gotta be dude, like, holy crap, this is exciting to watch. Dude, every it is. It is. So I said last year, you know, we started this, that fantasy thing. Right. And I said in years past, you could never have it because it was too predictable. Everybody would have the same team every single weekend. Yeah. And, and now the way it was last year, the way it is this year, you know, we go, we have, you know, 250 people playing the thing and some weekends, nobody has the perfect team. And the next weekend, one person does this, this weekend, we had six people, but six people out of 250 is not a lot, you know? So um, to have it be as unpredictable as it is, mm-hmm. is pretty awesome. And, and again, my biggest thing on wanting to, to have this conversation was to, for people to know what, you know, what you had going on behind the scenes, but also to be able to tell you, cause I know you're tough on yourself. And to be able to tell you, like, man, gotta be. I mean, gotta I, be. I, I, and I realize that I really do. I really do. But I, I'm <laughs> proud of you for the way that you know you're you're attacking this. I'm. You didn't bow out. I knew you never would, right? But you didn't bow out. You're you're facing this thing head on. You're putting your best effort forward, and you're getting hot at the right time. And and that was the the one other thing. And you touched on it, but. I truly think it's an opportunity because obviously, like I said, top fives aren't something you're writing home about. It, it never, it hasn't been for five years. Right. But maybe this year is the opportunity with the class being as stacked as it is with the hurdles that you've dealt with, with it not being easy. This might be the first time in a long time where top fives are something that you can you know, feel good about. And I hope that that's the case at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, uh, and then think about it. And Nick, think about when, when, cause that's the word you used when, yeah. when you, when you get that podium this year and how much yep. better that's going to feel than even the years. Uh, that'll, that'll be the most rewarding one yet of just everything. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I don't mean to use any of this as an excuse. No. You know, I, I could, I could be crying all over Instagram, Facebook, whatever, all day and blame everything. But at the end of the day, nobody cares. Right. That, you know, and everybody knows that like people say they care, they care, but no one cares. You got to figure it out on your own. And um, sometimes it's hard to swallow when it's told to you for the first time. And sometimes it takes you months, years to understand that and learn that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm hot right now. And when I'm on, it's, it's I'm definitely on and it could be hard to take that from me. And, but, you know, from what I went through, it it was, it was easy to come off track. Mm -hmm. So I I definitely came off track over the last six months, but it's been very hard to get back on the rails. And uh, I'm, you know, again, it's a fifth, it's not a podium. Um, I'm not going to praise myself that it's great, but it's the best so far this season. And I'm going to keep going from here yeah man. that's what i want to do 
it's a step yeah. in the it's a step in the right direction. Like I said, I thought it was glimpses of of the next news that we know and the next news that we love. And you know, I'm stoked to see you back in the top five. It was awesome to see you in the top five there at High Point. And it feels like you know this is the start of an uptick for you. That's how it feels for me, at least from the outside. And uh, yeah, we touched on you know fantasy stuff. Our, our digging deep ATBMX fantasy players should buy Nick stock Nick Janusa stock right now. Well, it's well, it's uh, just heating up, right? You're heating up at the right time. And uh, Nick, as always, man, you're such an awesome guest. I appreciate your time so much. I appreciate you know you, every time you join us. Uh, you're so real. You're so authentic, which I really appreciate. I think our listeners do too. And uh, yeah, I just want to appreciate, uh, want to thank you for your time and uh, looking forward to what Iron Man has in store. We'll see you there. Thank you. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Anytime. That's Nick Janusa brought to you by Integrated Financial Concepts and their Safe to Race and Safe to Ride Insurance programs right here on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. See you, pal. Thanks, Cody. We'll get right back to the show, but now a word from our sponsors. And thank you for listening to these ads. Without these great companies, none of this would be possible. Show your support for the people who support us. We used to speak of a CST takeover, but now 2022 is the year of CST supremacy. CST's Pulse MXR tires are the choice of Joel Hetrick, Jeffrey Ristrelli, and Nick Janusa, meaning CST tire riders are in contention for pro class wins and a possible podium sweep every time they hit the racetrack. CST tires are also the official tire choice of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast, but you already knew that. I, your host Cody Jansen, helped pioneer the CSD takeover with Pulse MXR fronts and white label soft compound rears on my way to back-to-back national championships and a pro sport podium to cap off the 2021 season. The Pulse MXR tire, available in soft and standard compounds, offer the highest level of traction, most predictable cornering, and superior wear characteristics when compared to the competition. Did I mention they offer contingency payouts as well? Visit shop.cst tires to join the CSD takeover today or prepare to be beat by someone who did. Joel Hattrick, Jeffrey Rastrelli, Nick Janusa, myself, and so many more believe and trust in CSD tires. Do you? You already know we're Team Blue Crew now more than ever here at the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. And whether it's eight time and reigning ATVMX Pro Class National Champion Chad Weenan, who with his next championship will become the winningest champion in ATV motocross history, or seven-time and current XC1 Pro ATV GNCC National Champion Walker Fowler, who is now tied for second all-time in titles one, it's clear the podium-proven Yamaha YFZ450R is the winning choice of sport ATVs. This continued and unprecedented success for the Yamaha YFZ450R, its unrivaled quality and performance, and the undisputable fact that Yamaha is the leading OEM supporter of ATV racing has resulted in an ever-growing Yamaha takeover within the sport quad market. Best yet, Yamaha's Blue Crew Racer Support Program is back and stronger than ever here in 2022, meaning Yamaha riders will once again cash in on payouts and prize opportunities, including a chance to win a brand new YFZ450R. For more info, head over to YamahaBlueCrew.com, follow them at Yamaha Outdoors on social media, and check out Yamaha's full proven off-road lineup at YamahaOutdoors.com today. SSI decals is a name synonymous with ATV racing, synonymous with big time success, and absolutely synonymous with the best looking decals around. An offshoot of their parent company that was established in 1947, SSI first took shape from owner Ian Harris's passion for ATVs. With what started as just making numbers and decals for riders like Chad Weenan, the company quickly took off. And today, you couldn't imagine ATV motocross without SSI decals. The graphics maker and designer now supports all the top teams in ATV motocross, as well as teams and riders racing GNCC, Work Series, Pro Motocross and Supercross, Canadian Pro Motocross, Short Course Off-Road Trucks, UTVs, Snowcross, and, oh yeah, six-time world champion top fuel drag racer Clay Milliken. No project is too big or too small for SSI decals, making your identity stick with championship-level graphics. Head over to SSIDecals.com today and then maybe call the doctor because things are about to get sick. The Digging Deep ATVMX podcast is brought to you in part by DID and their wide range of championship winning chains. From the street to the track and everywhere in between, DID chains are designed to give you the optimal riding experience with great performance and increased chain life. Consistent to the core, pick up your box of reliability today. DID, what drives you? We are proud to be partnered with Numira Technologies. Since 2001, Numira has led the charge in the ATV and side-by-side market covering more applications than anyone else in the industry. Namira's advanced piston technology uses a NASA-exclusive aluminum alloy that helps to reduce expansion rates, allows for tighter tolerances, and leads to higher overall engine performance for your machine. For more information about Namira's wide offerings of pistons, rings, gaskets, 
industry-leading top-end repair kits, and recently added connecting rods, visit your local dealer or online at www.namira.com. Namira Technologies, your one-stop shop, engine, component, supplier. We are pleased to be partnered with Bronco ATV and UTV Components. Bronco has been an industry leader in replacement hard parts and accessories for all makes and models for over 15 years. With a catalog that includes a full line of electrical components, engine internals and cylinders, shock and suspension parts, winches, clutch kits, valves, carb kits, bearing kits, and drive chain parts, Bronco is your hard parts source for whatever you need for whatever you ride. Available exclusively through distributors around the world, visit your local dealer or online at broncoatv.com. Forworks Carbon's innovative lightweight products include top-notch seat covers, carbon fiber, and plastic hoods, gas tank covers, exhaust shields, shock guards, and much more. Whether you have an ATV, UTV, or snowmobile, Forworks has the goodies that will improve your ride and make you salivate. We trust Forworks for increased function and a sexier look, and you should too. Forworks Carbon, always working hard to bring high quality and innovative parts to the market. Check them out today at fwcarbon.com. All right, back here with Shane Hitt and Casey Greek on the Digging Deep ATBMX podcast. You just heard from Nick Janusa there. Uh, we'll discuss his strong day as we go here. Uh, but jumping back into our coverage of Pro Moto 2 at High Point, and Casey, I think we knew exactly what would happen if Joel got the whole shot there in Moto 2, and that's exactly what happened. The race was over before it even started. Yeah, I think he, you know, he put a lot of focus into that second start. He had to re- redeem himself from, you know, a not so good start in the first moto. And then we say not so good start, he was still top five. I mean, <laughs> we would just expect, you know, Joel to be one or two every time he comes out. You his, know, standards, on the start, his, but... his standards are so high. <laughs> and, you know, that, that says volumes for him and, and the program that they're putting together over there. But, no, I mean, it was kind of status quo in the sense he jumped out early lead and just put the hammer down. I mean, and he was a lot of fun to watch. I think that's, you know, the exciting part. But, yeah, Moto2 was definitely not as explosive and, you know, exciting to say as Moto1. It was cool to get to see Brandon and Jeffrey come through the pack. Yeah. Uh, Max and Bryce battled for a little while there together. And, you know, to me, and kind of getting ahead, but the thing that I – the most I took away from Moto2 – or even the whole weekend was the gap between Chad Weenan and third, third place. And we've always seen that gap at times be really big 40, 45 seconds or whatever it is. And I think it was, it was never over 15 seconds, the entire moto. Mm-hmm. And that keeps Chad honest, you know, the whole time, but it's got to keep guys like Max Lindquist and Bryce Ford, you know, their mentality has got to be even better. Like we're just not getting stomped. Like, we're right there. If something was to go wrong, if Chad spun out or something silly, they're going to be right there in position to be able to make a pass and, and put themselves into a better position. Yeah, exactly. The The racing was tight. I mean, that that third place spot is getting closer. At least it was on this weekend. Uh, so Chad Weenan, he was second throughout this one. Hetrick's lead swelled to 10 seconds at its largest before he backed it down just a touch to be safe there. Uh, so Joel Hetrick grabs his 101st and 102nd moto wins as a professional. Uh, I was I was pumped to hear him drop the 100 moto wins on the podium. Um, that we were able to shed some light on that last weekend or last week. So that was awesome to hear. Um, And that was this weekend at high point was his 48th overall win of his career. So he's now extended his consecutive win streak to six consecutive overalls dating back to last season, the longest such streak of his career. And not to mention it was his sixth straight overall victory at high point as well, dating back to 2014. His points lead is now 27. And as I said on social media, it's simply Joel Hetrick's world and we're just living in it. I don't know what is left to say, Shane. Um, but it, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what or or who or I don't know like if anything is going to be able to stop Joel Hetrick at this point. We've never seen him so dominant. Yeah, those stats are insane. I mean, 102 wins. That's 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 a um, six overall. What'd you say he's won high point now? Six years in a row. Six years in a row. Yep. That's that, that's that's amazing. But yeah, I don't know that. I mean, in in the the years past, him and Chad has always been pretty close in the points. So if one of them broke, the other one was going to win. He's going to be so far ahead now in another race or two that he could break and still win. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, some some years you're lucky, some years you're good, and some years you're both. And I mean, he's got everything going right now. He just better mm-hmm. keep doing what he's doing. He's just got everything so dialed. It's like he's just 
totally in control, even though he's going just so ridiculously fast. Casey, this is the hottest streak of his career. Um, six, you know, overall wins in a row now dating back to last season, hottest streak of his career. And, you know, this is the best we've ever seen him. I think that that goes without saying, I don't know, you know, like I said, I don't know what's going to possibly be able to, to stop this guy. Like Shane said, in my mind, and we've seen it happen with Chad once, well, literally once. Um, and then Joel, you know, but where these guys suffer a mechanical or something and, and, you know, it's taboo, you don't want to mention it, but where that gets everything closer. Well, Joel's getting to the point, like Shane said, where even with a mechanical, he could have a mechanical up in the next moto, the first moto at, at uh, Crawfordsville, and he would still have the points lead. So um, it's getting to that dangerous point. I don't, I don't know what's going to stop this guy. Yeah, it all comes down to racecraft and and putting a whole program together. I mean, he spent he spent a lot of time this winter riding down in Decker's place. They spent a lot of time with the Phoenix guys testing and and fine tuning this machine. You know, we tested with him a bunch, and and him himself, I think, you know, he's in a really good place at home. You know, they they got their place down in North Carolina. He's closer to the shop. And we talked about it. it's it's putting the whole program together to become a champion and be, you know, in the championship contending spot where I think, you know, last year we've seen some distractions come into Joel's life. Um, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, you, you got to take, you know, some spots or, you know, he, he sold a house. I mean, it's no secret. He sold his house. He had a good opportunity to make some serious money on it. And so you can't be mad at that. I mean, you know, you just got to be able to pick up on those things. So you're not beating your head against the wall. You know, for me as a suspension guy and working with the Phoenix team and, you know, Jay, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Like, are we doing something wrong? Why is this kid getting beat? Because we know he's the fastest guy most of the time. And so when he's not winning, you're like, you start looking in the mirror at yourself or looking into things and, I don't know that's always the case. Sometimes it's just the rider. Sometimes it's just what's going on outside of racing. So Joel, Joel dialed that in to a sense of where his racecraft is really good, and that's that's a very dangerous Joel Hetrick. Come on, Casey. It's never the rider's fault. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> it's always – Trust me. <laughs> Hey, hey, me, a, hey, guy. <laughs> I was going to say a lot of times, you know, sometimes it's the mechanic's fault. Most times it's the suspension guy's fault. Yeah, it's always, always I, race. If I got beat, it was Curtis Parks' fault or it was Wayne's fault. It was, it was never my fault. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, you know I, what? I like to tell Baldwin all the time. I said, you know, Timmy won a lot of races if he had a good mechanic. But <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to give Mark a heart. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, you know, I think last year down the stretch, you know, we knew Joel was was dealing with some stuff in his personal life, like Casey said, not bad. So you don't want to make it sound like it was bad stuff. It was just other things. So he couldn't solely focus on racing. And I think at the same time, we were seeing Chad just have you know, I mean, he was spot on late last season. And I think, you know, you're, now you're just seeing that with Joel Hetrick. I mean, uh, the he's started hot. It's been a lot of tracks that he's good at. And it's just been the perfect combination where he's he's thriving right now. Um, so, yeah, in, incredible day there for Joel Hetrick. Uh, first overall, 1-1, one, one, um, just adding, padding his stats. And uh, he'll look to extend that, that streak of his to seven straight overall victories at Crawfordsville, another track that he's really, really good at. Um, but finishing up high point here, so joining Hetrick and Weenan on the podium was a guy who, like Casey said already, has quietly tightened up his, his program immensely this season. Season. Bryce Ford has been rock solid as he goes three, four for third overall on the day. Um, he just keeps impressing Casey. You touched on him a little bit. I don't know if you want to, you want to, you know, say anything more about Bryce's day here. Um, but again, quietly, like you said, just tightening up the little things in his program. I mean, uh, we, we've always known that he's had the speed, but now again, and week after week, we're saying kind of the same stuff, but he's just getting a little bit better and a little bit better and a little more consistent. And he's the same Bryce each and every weekend. And I think that that's all we were waiting to see from him. Yeah. And I think that's, what he looked in the mirror and said, like, what do I got to do? And so, you know, there was, there was a couple spots where like he closed in on Max and I asked him after the race, I'm like, what's up? Like you closed in, why didn't you make the move? And he's like, it's just the risk versus the reward. I knew I had third, you know, I, a solid points day. 
you know, I knew, you know, Jeffrey and Brandon were down early. So, you know, I'm building points on those guys. Max is a little further back in points right now after a pretty rough Georgia. So, you know, for Bryce, it's the same thing. I say it and, I, and I'm such a believer in it. It's, it's the race craft mm-hmm. and it's putting the whole program to be, together and he's maturing. And, and it's funny to say because he's 19 mm-hmm. and he's maturing into, you know, to become one of these guys and to become that's I don't know, we can't call him a legend yet. He's 19, but to become one of those guys, to be a Shane Hitt, a Timmy Farr, a Joel Hedrick, a Chad Weenan, a Jeffrey Rustelli, like these guys made their staple in this sport because of their racecraft. And that's what Bryce is doing right now. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think that he's becoming one of those guys that can be a podium guy each and every weekend. And it was cool to see him and Max. And we saw this a couple times last year, but it's kind of a, like a look into the future, right? These, these are the future stars if they stick with it. Um, and, and yeah, it's going to be fun to see. They're just both so young, both teenagers and they're at the front, front of the, the, pro class and podium positions it's amazing um so what do you see from from young bryce ford and and you can throw max linguist in there as well shane uh do you see like future champions in these youngsters yeah those uh, to me those are the two the two hottest kids coming yeah uh when i watch them and, and max is solid um bryce i mean obviously i've been watching him years because he's dealt with baldwin yep. uh, and he uh i mean ac said it just mature. I mean, you could watch it from, from like last year or two years ago to last year to this year. I mean, just everything about him. I mean, he's just matured so much. And I'm, I think in a, another year or two, he's going to be a handful. Um, to me, he looks like on the bike, he does a little more, a little more work than he has to. It just looks like he's just all over the place, you know? And I'm like, he just needs to kind of settle down and relax and ride. I mean, he's just, I mean, he's, all over the place and I'm like he just to me he looks like he uses way too much energy um to be I mean I I feel like he could go the same speed if he just got out there and just rode but I mean I think with uh time and and maturing and and, he, and he's looked better this year than than last year last year I mean he probably went just as fast but he was just all over the place and and he looked good this weekend he looked good in Florida um and, and obviously I want to see him do good because he rides for Mark and he, of course, he's wearing that that number four. And I'd like to see Cody get up there and run with him too. Um, but I talked to him a little bit this weekend, and, and you know, like he doesn't. He says he's not very good on the hard pack, high speed tracks like High Point. He struggles with those. And but I mean, there's a lot of those tracks. So I mean, you got to work on them. And I mean, if these guys want to get better, I mean, all they need to do is sit down and watch some film with Joel. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, ex- exactly. I think that we're seeing Cody get better and better. I mean, it obviously wasn't a, wasn't the, the greatest weekend for him. It's not, wasn't the weekend he wanted, but we've seen flashes from him already this season that have been impressive. And, and Bryce, like, you know, you touched on his energy and um, all the movement on the bike and stuff. And he's even toned that down, you know, from years past, he is, he is getting, you know, a little, little more calmed down. And I posted on social media, but so often in professional sports, I think that it's year three, is so key for these guys where they really take a a big step forward in their career. And I think that that's exactly what we're seeing from Bryce. I think that, again, like you said, Shane, I mean, he's always had the speed. That's never been an issue. I mean, he was blistering fast last year, but he crashed two or three times in one moto there. Um, So the speed has never been an issue. But, you know, this year we're seeing more poise, more patience, more veteran like Savvy and Casey, like you said, you know, he didn't have to make that pass in the second moto. He had the, the podium spot good points day. And that's what he decided to do. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what, you know, these younger riders are, are learning from, you know, doing this thing a little bit longer and, and uh, being up front more and seeing what Joel and Chad do. And I think even with Joel, like you saw him over the years, emulate what Chad has done, the, the professional nature of how he runs his race program and all those things. So um, yeah, it's just, just awesome to see this new wave of riders coming. That's uh, that's so exciting. So uh, third place in Moto2, uh, we've touched on him a little bit. Third place in Moto2, fourth overall in the day was Max Linquist, another ridiculously talented youngster. And uh, Casey, you touched on this already. Chad even said on the podium, um, he made a comment after the Moto, but, you know, Max kept Chad honest for a good, you know, half plus of, of that second moto on Saturday. And again, like you said, that's that's notable that these guys are, you know, kind of keeping that 
front too honest. Yeah, and I think that's what we need for the sport. And, you know, I think Max and Bryce probably know deep down that, you know, they're sort of in that driver's seat of, of the younger kids coming through and, and to be guys that win races. And I, I think they honestly both believe right now that they can win races right now and they want to win races right now. And you can see it in the battles that we've seen them with some of these guys. They're not backing down. They're not stepping aside. They're battling because they know they belong. So, you know, that's the most important thing that I see with it. And it's really good for the our sport and the direction that it's going. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I agree 100 percent. And then from, you know, from those kind of younger guys, we we kind of move on to a mainstay, more of a guy that's been around like Jeffrey Rastrelli or some of these guys have been around a little longer. We heard from Nick Janusa a bit ago, and I, you know, I thought he had a really strong day, fourth in qualifying, which was impressive, uh, six, five for fifth overall. I felt like it was a major step in the right ju- direction for Nick Janusa, Casey. Uh, he was fast all day. He just looked a little racier than we've seen in recent weeks. It was, you know, kind of back to, I guess, what we expect from Nick Janusa and and, and like I said to him, those first couple races, I mean, when two of them are mud races, like how do you evaluate them? Right. But um, I just, I felt like from the jump, from, you know, the beginning of the first qualifier, he was more Nick Janusa than we've seen. And I think that that's notable. Yeah, for sure. And we went through, I, I spent some time with him on Friday, just checking ride height and making you know, some small adjustments um, ride height wise for obviously for this style of track and, I, I could just tell he was better. Um, you know, his mom and dad were there. It, it was just, he had a better vibe. And so, and it was like from the first get go and qualifying, I mean, he jumped out. He always usually jumps out pretty quick and starts, you know, turning some laps early and qualifying, but he looked better, um, faster, more aggressive, and just more, like you said, exactly, just more Nick Janusa like what we expect from him. So, I was super happy with him. Um, I think he was, he left a lot more positive from this race than he has in some of the races in the past this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Heavy, heavy conversation uh, that the listeners heard from him. I mean, we know the, the hardships or the adversity that their family has faced with his dad having that stroke. And, um, you know, it's a lot of, you know, outside noise that he's dealing with and stuff. That's why I wanted to talk to him because I think that that added context to the season that he's had kind of shows us, um, you know, how, I guess how impressive it's actually been for to be dealing with what he's been dealing with, but also show up and, and get top fives like this. That's why I wanted to hear from him. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a, a solid, uh, solid day for him. And one of the other things that we touched on with Nick Janusa is how strong this class is. And Shane, I'd like to get your opinion on that because, you know, we got all these, you know, past champ, you're not one of them, but we got all these past, you know, champions, past legends that like to weigh in about, you know, it's, you know, th- these classes aren't nearly as stacked as what they used to be in all these things. And uh, I, I got to get your opinion on that because yes, like you can look at some of the lineups from 2007 or eight when all the facts were around and you know even dating back prior to that um the hybrid era had a lot of legendary names in there so that's kind of a different comparison at the same time i i really think that these classes right now this pro class is really really talented because you look and there's there's no slouches out there they're all really really good there's no average guys out there to make the front pack look crazy fast so i would like to at least um at least get your opinion on how you think the quality of this 2022 pro class is oh it's stacked and and the problem with, with what's going on right now is the same thing as it's been this way for the last few years everybody looks at the pro class and they think it's chad ween it's joel hetrick it's thomas brown thomas you know he's done he's not racing anymore so now they it's basically two guys, but what they don't realize is these, these two guys are both really, really good. But if you take those two guys out of it from basically from third on back is some, some tight racing um, and good racing. And they're all good. It's just those, two, those two guys just, you know, they're just better than everybody. And it makes it look like the field's not that good, which is not true. I mean, if, if you want to go out there and ride with those guys and I've rode with some of those guys up at Breedwood and stuff like Nick Janusa and, and Hogue and some of those guys, those guys are fast. They're really fast. But 
it just goes to show you how much faster or how much better like Joel and Chad is. But I mean, that whole pro class, I mean, and I think it's a, it's the same in a lot of sports. There's not huge numbers. Like I think there was maybe 16 riders there the other day yep. in the pro class. But the, the thing about it is all 16 of them is pretty doggone good. <laughs> um, it's not like, you know, when we used to get 25, 30 riders and you knew there was, you know, eight or 10 of them that wasn't worth a shit. Shouldn't have been out, you know, but now you've got, I mean, the, 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 the 16, they're, they're quality riders. They're good riders. They're there for, so I think it's a stacked field. Now you want to go back to 2007, 2008, when you had all the factory guys with Wimmer and Creamer and, and Digger and uh, Bird and, and some of those guys, you know, those, that was a stacked era, but it was a different era, you know, and, um, that was probably, if, if you want to look at them, I think that was probably the toughest year of all. I mean, they all had – most of the top guys had factory riders, all good stuff. So, that was that was a tough year. Uh, but, I mean, today, these guys aren't – these guys are all good. There they're isn't anybody out there that's slow. I mean, you, these guys may stand up here and say, oh, there's only two guys in the pro class. Well, put your shit on and go out there and ride with them and see. That's exactly so right. I, <laughs> that's exactly right. I think comparing it to 2007 or eight is tough. Comparing it to 2013, 14, 15, I think that these classes easily take the cake. I, and those are classes I was in. I'd love to be able to say, hey, you know, it was harder back in my day. It wasn't. Like they, you know, I've said time and time again that those weekends, those races were predictable. You could basically slot the top 10 and where they should finish. And that's not how it is anymore. So um, we've talked on show after show. If you took out the top two, the whole class would be unpredictable right now. And just be, and that's the argument that we've been making. So it's awesome to hear you say that, Shane. Is those top two are two of the all-time greats? It just so happens that these other guys got to race them. It just so happens that Joel and Chad have to race each other. Thankfully, this is something I've said to Casey time and time again. Thankfully, we still have you know those two have each other. Otherwise, Chad Weenan would be all all alone out front for you know race after race every year, or vice versa with Joel Hetrick doing the same thing. We're not seeing that. Thank goodness. Um, thankfully, they have each other. And if you know, just because the just the argument of just two riders doesn't hold up with me because they're two of the all time greats. It's not it's not the rest of the class's fault. No, no, I agree 100. percent They are two of the all-time great. I don't know that all the years I've raced, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone faster than Joe Hetrick. Right. I mean, and I last four or five years. I mean, he may not win the championship every year because he has some issues, but it's not because his speed's not there. He is fast, and you know, obviously Chad's going to be the greatest of all time. I think the difference between you know one and two. I mean, it, now people look at that and say there's only two good guys. Well, it's not true. The rest of them are really good. It's just those are two all-time greats. And, and then if you go back and look at the other years, it was just more com- – the, we were just more competitive, like through my era. There was, you know, seven, eight guys that could win when, when I was racing, which that really would mess up the points. Mm-hmm. Um, like now these guys can't have any mistakes. They have to be first or second mm-hmm. or their season's pretty much over. Mm-hmm. Or if they break their season's over back – through that era when you got five six seven eight guys that can win you could have a bad race plus the point system was different you could break one moto and come out and win the next moto and still end up fourth or fifth overall because the way the points was it was for it was for the weekend it was for the overall where right. now it's moto which just changed everything too so um i think the guys now are really good and and i mean i i, I see why people think that but I've rode with those guys and I stood up there and I stand up there and tire and watch some of those guys and yeah, I can still beat some of those guys. But. <laughs> yeah. I love to hear that's the same thing with old Joe bird. He thought he could too, but then he, he, he decided not to go to Daytona. He smartened up. So. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, so do you look at Joel Hattrick as like a modern day, Jeremiah Jones, you know, I think that so many people look at him that way, riding style, his intensity, the, what he does on the bike. Is that how you think of, of Joel Hetrick? Because like you said, maybe he doesn't win every championship, but is the fastest guy kind of no question. Yeah, he is. I mean, yeah, he's kind of like Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah, he just looked, Jeremiah was a little more out of control. I mean, Joel, like this weekend, the last few times I'm he actually is pretty well in control. Jeremiah, I mean, he always looked like he was wrecking. I mean, he was, I mean, I was around him. my dad's like, I'm going to tie a string from his bike to your bike so you can keep up with him. I said, hell no, I don't want to go that fast. But, uh, 
Jeremiah was he was wide open, out of control, but he never wrecked. I mean, he just looked like he was going to wreck. But and he backed it into the corner like Joel does. Joel's just backs in the corner, but we were on two strokes and it was a little different. You know, two strokes were were made to back in the corner. They were light and didn't tend to flip as easy as the four strokes did. But um so I don't know. I mean, Joel rides that thing like a two stroke. And so he he gets it, you know, and, and I mean, he's fun to watch. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, uh, jumping back into the, the rest of the pro class here. So Brandon Hogue ended up sixth overall on the day um, after that that first corner melee. And Jeffrey Australia was involved in that as well. So he ends up seventh overall. We touched on both of those guys already. Michael Allred, eighth overall. I don't even know what to say about this guy anymore, Casey. Um, I'm so freaking impressed by this guy. So uh, this weekend, um, I know you work with him this weekend. He did it in dry conditions. What a performance for, for Michael Allred Casey. I was super impressed again. I already touched on it. I'm a little salty because, you know, I think that that upped his pick trend when he shows up in the top five of the, the fantasy stuff. So seven people had the perfect lineup that included him. I don't know if they would have had it, if he would have been 10th fastest. Um, but man, he's, he's a gamer. He just shows up every week um, and he keeps getting better. I am so impressed by Michael Allred Casey. Yeah, and it's putting yourself in a good position early in the race, and that's what Michael's been doing. I mean, he he really had to kind of back down his starts in a sense because he had a lot of upside-down first corners last year, and so we're not seeing that out of him. Um, so he, it's the same thing. He's maturing awesome. He's, you know, he's not a 19-year-old, but he is fresh into the pro class, let's say, and He's maturing as a rider, and, and his speed is good, and he's been getting some good riding time in with some guys that, you know, are helping him build speed. He's rode with Joel a few times. He's rode with Max. You know, he's getting to do that, and, you know, he's still going to work every day. He's still a blue-collar guy, and I think that's what's putting him in these positions to be the rider that he's becoming and, and working towards it. it. It's good. I mean, I don't – I think he was happy with the day, but I don't know that he is – overly happy with eighth I know he's got a big goal and he wants to be a top five guy he wants to get that top five you know monkey off his back he's gotten some good finishes but he overall wise he's really want to put himself there and, and I think Michael can't he's got to continue to put good starts in and be there at the end of the moto and I think he can you know call it luck or whatever I mean I think that's half of racing is luck so he's putting himself closer and closer to that goal and I, I think that's awesome for Michael. Yeah, it, it really is. When you see the names that are in front of him, when you see, you know, look at Hogue is sixth, Jeffrey Australi is seventh, and, and Michael Allred is eighth. I mean, he should be. I mean, I get the competitor in him. He should be happy with eighth, though. Those are kind of, kind of, you know, those other riders have done, you know, they're podium guys, right? So um, just awesome yeah. to see him out there doing that. And I think it's a testament to, you know, a guy who just, like every weekend gets good starts and he's just picking up on that front pack speed a little more and a little more every weekend. I think that that's a testament to that. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, Shane could probably be a good influence on that or, you know, knows how that stuff works is, you know, basically rising to the occasion because you're putting yourself in that position and then you're learning each time that you're up there and you're like, man, what, you know, let's say, you know, he was, top five out of the gate or whatever and he was battling with Bryce and Max it's like what are they doing different so different than I'm doing and so you get to pick up on that your journal and and each time it's you're just raising your own bar the more and more you're up there yeah touch on that Shane what is it like I mean I the more you're up in that fast pack there's there's no other way to simulate that speed in, unless you see it firsthand no and that's that's the way you learn too is you got to find someone better than you and you know getting those good starts for him is really important because that puts him up front out of, out of all the craziness in the back. Mm-hmm. And then he can learn and pick up lines from guys and that, and that you just learn from those guys. I mean, that's the way I did through my whole career. I mean, I would try to find someone better than me and that's who I'd go ride with. And, and uh, that's really the way you get better and, and getting good starts and doing it in a race is the most important thing because I mean, going out and practicing with the guys, one thing, uh, but getting a good start and having to do it because we used to always call it, you know, practice pace and race pace. Mm-hmm. They're different. Um, you know, you may practice, say I'd put in a 20 minute moto, but a 20 minute moto practice and it's not a 20 minute moto of the race. Mm-hmm. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, there's no way to see Shane, Shane, I'll let you finish there, but there's no way to see that intensity 
that you see in a race situation. There's just no way to simulate that in practice and seeing that race pace, like you said, from those other fast guys in a race, you know, scenario is how, how a, a younger rider or a fresher rider, a newer rider picks up on that. No, it is. And in your heartbeat and your, and everything is just different. I mean, when you're racing, I mean, you can go out and practice all day long and you're just, you're kind of comfortable and you're riding in your zone, but when you get out with those guys and then you're trying to pass those guys or riding with those guys, and you're breathing, your heart rate, I mean, everything changes and, mm-hmm. and it's just, I mean, it's hard, but I mean, you just got to want it. And I don't see no reason why he can't. I mean, some, somebody's going to have to step in there and beat those guys. You just got to work at it and go. Yeah, the, the coolest thing for me, and, and sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my head around this, is um, in 2019, Mike and I are racing 25 plus. And, you know, that's after my pro career. I'm just doing it for fun. And he's on the uptick at 25 years old. He's, you know, getting better. And just to, if I would think back then that he was going to turn into a, like an eighth place staple week in and week out in 2022 in the pro class, it's just, it's so cool to see that happen. So I'm so stoked for, for Michael to be doing this. Michael already eighth overall at high point. I'm stoked for him. So uh, going down the list here, Logan Stanfield, he ends up ninth overall. Um, I know he's not happy with that, but it's a more Logan Stanfield like day for him than we've seen. He's had some, some hardships and hurdles here so far this season, Patrick Torini, um, the Italian, he ends up 10th again, top 10 again for him. Super impressed by him. Uh, so congrats to him on another top 10 and, and leading his tier in ATV fantasy stuff. And Zach Decker, um, he ends up 11th overall. Did something happen in the first moto Casey, Zach Decker, did, did he crash or something in the first moto there? Yeah. Um, I'm still salty about that. Uh, <laughs> Him and Cody Ford, I guess, got together and somehow, I don't know if it pulled, you know, how everyone kind of puts their kill cord through their buckle on their pants. Somehow it pulled it and he lost it. So like it was gone. He looked for it. He looked for it for almost two laps and then found something, wedged it in there, got in the cans here, got another tether and then got going. And so that kind of shut his first moto down. But I mean, overall, Zach rode really well. He rode really good. He fought tooth and nail with Jeffrey you know, for the last couple of laps there in the second moto to hold Je- to end up holding Jeffrey off. So, um, you know, not an awesome day on paper, say, for Zach Decker, but I think second moto riding wise, he he rode really well. Oh, for sure. So that adds so much context and explanation to the first moto there. Um, I, I thought I thought he was going to slay it for my fantasy team this week. I, I thought this was the week on these conditions, right? And go figure, he loses his tether. I'm like, what's going on? Because he was he was a long, long way back. He was, wasn't going to catch anybody in that first moto, right? So, um, yeah, that, that sunk my fantasy team. Um, but, yeah, second moto. So he started outside the top ten. He had last gate pick, obviously. Got as high as sixth, ended up seventh. And, uh, you know, just awesome. Like one of these weeks, he's going to put it all together and it's going to be nearly a top five ride for him. Like as a rookie, man, he's been, he's been really, really strong. And again, he's kind of like a Bryce Ford. When we first saw him, when we first saw Bryce come in super, super fast, it's just putting the whole package together. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, I mean, he sunk your team just like he sunk mine. And I told Zach, I said, i I had you. I'm like, whoa, you know, but it, it, that's what it's all about right there. But um, speed wise, he's great. Um, him and Logan, you know, Logan had some bad, bad luck the first moto. Mm-hmm. And, but I did get to see him and Zach ride together again in the second moto. So it was kind of cool. It's something that I've kind of said that was going to happen. And so when I, when I get proved myself right, I always like that, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, Zach's got a lot of potential and, he, we talked about it in shows earlier this year. He just got to keep plugging and keep growing, keep learning, and he's going to be just fine. And he's, he's another guy that is very capable of um, squeaking out some top fives, and, and I expect him to do that. Yeah, I think it's all gonna it's all gonna fall into place one of these weekends. So that's gonna be exciting to see. Uh, Cody Ford ended up twelfth overall. Uh, we touched on him a little bit. Uh, Wesley Wolf thirteenth overall. What happened there, Casey? Um, 
Do you have any idea on what happened to Wesley? We lost him mid-second moto while he was running sixth. I thought that was going to be an opportunity for him as he kind of finds his footing after coming back from this injury. Didn't know what was, you know, I thought that that sixth there was going to be an opportunity for him to kind of run up near the top five where we expect him to be. Um, then we lost him. So do you know, do you know what happened there? Yeah, I didn't get to see what had happened. And, you know, obviously he was running very well. I think at one point he was fourth or fifth even in that moto. And then, you know, kind of got shuffled a little bit or whatever. And then uh, I talked to him Sunday morning. And I was like, where'd you go? Like, because he just disappeared. And I couldn't see him nowhere on the track. So it was somewhere, obviously, where we couldn't see. But he some kind of bike malfunction or something. Um, I'm sure those guys will get it figured out pretty quick and get him back out there. So, is you know, but riding-wise, he's – kind of beaten I think the expectations of what we all think coming back off of that big of an injury and not riding very much so yeah. you know hats off to Wesley is awesome ride yeah credit to him just stoked to have him out there honestly I think that that's awesome uh class is better with him out there um rounding out the field then uh Vince Merman 14th overall Cesar Jimenez 15th and Cottrell Altamirano 16th as we continue our coverage from high point finishing up here let's shift gears from the pros to the amateurs and there's only one rider to kick off our amateur coverage with all right, guys, you have no idea how excited I am to talk to this next guest. I've known this young man for somewhere around eight or nine years, and his rise to stardom has been absolutely remarkable. But as stoked as I am for all his success, none of it has come as a surprise to me. Brought to you by our friends at Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, your go-to full-service steel supplier of new and surplus steel, aluminum, and stainless steel products. Say hello to High Point Pro Sport winner, Jaden J.J. Launderville. J.J., welcome to Digging Deep. Thanks so much for jumping on here to chat about what was an awesome weekend for you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Cody. I really appreciate it. Man, so I've joked for for a long time about, you know, being the leader of the J.J. Launderville fan club, right? For a long time now, I've been joking about that. So I was ecstatic when you grabbed the win at High Point. But how was it for you? Tell me about the, the race day and the emotions afterwards winning pro sport for the very first time as a rookie. Oh, yeah. So I was I was so pumped about it. And the day started off pretty good. I My first moto, I had a pretty bad start and came through the path. And about the third lap of the, uh, my first pro sport moto mm -hmm. at high point, mm -hmm. I got up to about third, caught the leaders. And then from there, it was just uh, trying to pass all of them and couldn't make a pass stick until the last corner. I almost got it. We were all going up the face at the same time. It was pretty sick, but okay. couldn't really get a drive. So ended up third in um, the first moto. Mm -hmm. And then the next uh, moto, the main uh, I was so nervous. Like <laughs> everything was just, I was just hoping everything would go good. And of course, you know, I pulled a really bad hole shot, came out around 10th, but it actually worked out really good because a few people got piled up in the second corner. Okay. So I just drove around them, made some uh, really easy passes that way. And then I was in third, I think around then. And then Brett Music was in front of me and I knew he was going to be super tough to pass because he was ripping all weekend yeah. and he won I'm pretty sure every main event in pro sport so far so mm -hmm. yep I I knew it was going to be really tough to get around him and I got around him pretty quick and then Aaron Salinas was in front of me mm -hmm. and I like he was ripping all weekend too so I'm like oh shoot like I really got to go yeah. and I'm pretty sure it was on either the first or second lap come down one of the big downhills he kind of took the outside. I took the inside, cut him off, pinch him off in the corner, got a good drive out. And I led every lap of the race then mm -hmm. after that. So it was um, really exciting race. Tried to, tried to put in a few heaters to extend the lead a little bit, but they say they stuck really close to me, which made it really tough those those few laps so yeah, yeah yeah so it's it's crazy when you look at like the timing and scoring because to the naked eye it would look like you just you know grabbed the whole shot and led the whole race right but we know that that's not what happened you had to make some passes on the first lap there was craziness like there is at all these pro sport races there's carnage going on in the first laps of these things you have to pass some of the best guys in the class to get there so the one thing I did want to ask you about was like you know as a such a young racer how, you're how old are you JJ 17 is that what you are 
Yep, I'm 17 right now. Yeah, that's what I thought. So you're 17 and you're racing guys that, you know, you've probably looked up to some of these guys like over the years. So talk about that. Like, what is that like to throw your hat in the ring and you got to go battle with these guys, guys that you've looked up to? Is that like intimidating? Is that where some of like the nerves come from? I mean, tell me about that because that's a hurdle for, for people. So I think that they can probably learn from what you have to say about this. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Brett, I've been watching him when he raced pro and everything, and, like, yeah. he, he's always been super fast. So just yeah. looking up to him and seeing, like, how fast he is from, like, a long time ago and even now, mm-hmm. like, all my nerves, like, seeing everyone in there, I just get – I get pretty nervous on the line. But mm-hmm. once the gate drops, the, the first lap, the nerves just kind of calm down and I get all get all in my flow. So, yeah, after that, it – after that, I'm usually pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so you so you win that second moto. You know, you know, you win the overall. Um, tell me about that. Like, tell me about the the podium. The you know the celebration, the champagne. Like, tell me about that. That had to be surreal for you. You've never done that before. Oh yeah, I've never done anything like that. And actually, it was a three way tie for first place. Mm-hmm. We all had the same points. So I had a three one. Aaron Salinas had a two two, mm-hmm. and Brett Music had a one three. So we all had uh, four points. So I wasn't even sure if I got the overall. So I pulled up to the podium and I I knew I was going to be on the podium, but I'm like, Mm -hmm. when I found out, I'm like, I was so stoked, like Mm -hmm. so excited about it. And then on the podium, like, I mean, I haven't really been up there that much because when I was on the two fifties, it was during COVID. So it was COVID year. Yeah. Yeah. COVID year. Yeah. So we didn't really even have a podium celebration then. And I mean, I was just, so stoked like yeah. so yeah. happy yeah mm-hmm. so it, and that's it's funny you touch on that because it wasn't that long ago like you know you weren't on a mini quad that long ago and you know yeah. you were such a big rider you've always been fast but as a big rider like that kind of worked against you on the mini quad so like you just said I mean you haven't done you know you haven't done the podium thing that many times because that year you dominated on a 250 um you know, that was that COVID year. So that's funny to think about, you know, you're winning pro sport. You've been, you've been dominant the last handful of years, but you know, the, the, the podium thing isn't normal yet. Like you still get that podium high, which is awesome because there's no better feeling than it doesn't even matter what class you're in, but that podium feeling like you kind of are sitting on the line before the uh, second moto thinking, man, I just want to be on that podium. Yeah. I I said a prayer that morning. Like I, I felt it, like I felt something really good was going to happen. Mm-hmm. I said a prayer on the line too. Like, please, please let me at least like get on the podium again. Cause I, I actually got on the podium at Aonia pass, but yeah. that was a mud race. So I didn't really, it wasn't as special, I guess, but it was still like super special and stuff. Of course. But like for like a not mud race, just like raw speed, like getting on the podium that way, it was it was crazy and winning too that that made it extra special so Mm -hmm. you know and that's one thing that I did think about going into the weekend I'm like you know when a rider gets that podium for the first time um it it, you know as a rider you naturally expect that you're like okay now that podium spot or one of those podium spots that's my spot so I had been thinking to myself I'm like you know we might see JJ kind of elevate his game here um and then you go out and win so that was incredible i was so stoked to see that happen and not only did you get the win in pro sport but you won production a and 450a at high point as well three overalls which you did on the 250 i thought it was amazing then so to do it in in pro sport and two a classes is incredible and you had to battle some you know some more muddy conditions on sunday inevitably uh tell me about that yeah um sunday i was i was really hoping the races would keep would get canceled because I would have for sure had three right. overalls by then. Right. But um, it ended up not getting canceled. But um, yeah, for my first uh, production A race of the day, it was super muddy, and I got a got a pretty decent start. I think second. Um, the leader can't, can't really remember exactly who it was, but I saw him pull his goggles off first corner. So I'm like, okay, I know if I can get ahead of him, just like roost him, like. He, he he's done like he he can can keep up with all that roost so mm-hmm. yeah I got around him I think the first lap and um they cut all the races by a lap luckily because in case something mechanical would have happened I wouldn't yeah. have got the overall right so yeah um I ended up getting the overall in that one winning that one and then uh 458 that was one of the later races in the day 
and it actually rained before that too in between those two which which was pretty crazy but um yeah it, it was even more muddy and super slick you know how uh how can get super slick and uh blue oh, yeah. yeah but and the rain on that made it so difficult so i got a second place start in that one on the whole shot um i can't exactly remember who was in front oh uh Payton Lingle, he was in front of me, okay. and he got the third the day before, so I knew all I had to do was stay in second, and of course, I made a mistake. Um, first lap, went off the track, got kind of stuck, came back on in, I think, like, third or fourth, um, and, and I was I was so mad at myself, like, made a mistake, shouldn't have made that, just kind of pushing a little too hard, because okay. I had the overall, but um, yeah. then at that point, I knew, like, I had to go. So I made a few passes, kind of forced them because I knew they would make mistakes when they heard me behind them mm -hmm. and because they're going to be pushing too. Yep. So, um, yeah, I got second, knew I didn't have to catch Payton. And he, he was ripping all day too. So he, he was gone from all of us. So um, I was pretty happy I didn't have to catch him because I wouldn't have had the overall then. Right. But, um, yeah, I got the overall in that one. And winning all three, you know, it was it, it, it was my first week in actually winning since my injury. Mm -hmm. So I was so stoked to win all three. Yeah. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, like, even if, even if it's in a class you're expected to win, right. In the mud, like the mud makes me nervous just because so many different things can happen. It's almost like, you know, it's an equalizer. It is an equalizer for everybody. And, uh, and, and yeah, it might take some of the speed advantages you might have away. So I don't, like I said, I don't know about you, but mud always makes me nervous. So then, you know, to overcome that, you know, you're hoping maybe the, and I've been there too, where I'm hoping, man, I won my heat race. I know I'm going to get the overall, the races get canceled to have that not happen and still go out there and get all three overalls, man, it doesn't get any better than that. Oh yeah. You know, I was after that third one, like I, when I knew I had the overall, I was, I was so stoked and I was just like, so happy about everything that happened. And like, I mean, kind of glad that the races didn't get canceled because I got another day of riding, but mm -hmm. still, yeah, got right. the overall. Right. Hindsight being 2020, obviously you wouldn't have changed anything, but you don't know that on Sunday morning when it's raining. So, um, yeah. so yeah, you touched on the injury there. So all this success is awesome, obviously, but all this success on the heels of a nasty injury, um, has to make what you're doing here in 2022 that much sweeter. So tell people what happened last year that prematurely ended your season and the injuries that you had to overcome because they were nasty. Oh yeah. It was a, it was an insanely bad injury that I had. I, I can't remember the exact uh, month it happened, but it was after the second race, um, actually after High Point last year, mm -hmm. the week right after that, um, I was at a practice track, uh, Wheeler, Wheeler, Wisconsin, um, mm -hmm. and I was coming around a corner, fourth gear tapped, hit a braking bump, and it shot me completely sideways. I stuck my arm out, and it hyperextended and dislocated it, where it was like just basically skin holding it on, mm -hmm. which was pretty nasty. And then I had a pretty bad head injury too, like really bad concussion. Couldn't really see for a few hours and then um, got to the hospital. They couldn't really do anything about it because it was uh, too swollen at the time. So it was like a month or two after that before I actually had surgery. And what they actually had to do was uh, take some tendons from my wrist and put them in my elbow. They had to move a whole bunch of nerves around and I still have wires holding on my muscles and tendons and ligaments right now so it's oh gosh. pretty crazy to think about that because after that they told me it was supposed to be an 18 or 12 to 18 month recovery yeah. so to think that it only took about nine months of recovery time and like super hard work putting in all the time in the gym to make my elbow just perfect and uh right like how it was before mm -hmm. and um like i i should still be in a cast and everything from it and so good because I'm still out here racing. So yeah. Yeah. So so last year, about this time, not too long from now, when I saw you for the first time after you hurt your your arm. And yeah, like I I feel like you know, you and your dad were very much thinking you know, maybe you're not even racing in 2022. So then I start to see videos and pictures and stuff of you in the preseason at Deckers and riding and looking awesome. And I'm like, man, like, is he really doing this? And then to see where you are now, it's, it's just incredible. And your dad said to me, like, and, and like you're saying, I mean, you still have stuff going on with your arm. Like, 
your dad said, like, you're not even 100% back yet. So I have to assume, you know, all this time that you had spent over the last nine months or whatever, all this time in the gym and rehabbing, all this time spent off the four wheeler, which I know you. So I know how much you absolutely love riding your four wheeler. I have to believe that all this time and all the stuff you had to endure and all this difficulties and all that stuff has to make what you're doing, like just being at the races that much sweeter, but then obviously enjoying this success, like winning now is probably better than ever having gone through what you've just gone through. Oh yeah, for sure. It's way better thinking all the hardships and everything that we went through Mm -hmm. over the last year. And it just, fueled the fire, I guess, just mm-hmm. made, made me that more, uh, I, I don't know what the right word is, but that more excited and ready to just go out and race and give it my all and, you know, yeah. try my best. So, yeah. 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 That's incredible. So I wasn't, so you're 17 when I was 15, almost 16, I tore my ACL MCL and meniscus and it, and it's, it, I mean, that's a severe injury, I guess, but it's not like the structural damage that you had. So it's a little different, but in the same way, man, it made me love riding my four wheeler so much more. Cause prior to that, just like you, I mean, sun, rain, snow, wind, whatever, like we were always riding. So I never even got a chance to miss it. Right. And I had to, I I couldn't ride for nine months. So similar timetable to you and man, it just made me love riding my four wheeler so much. I remember like months after my injury. So I couldn't ride my race quad, but I was bombing around the the farm field while everybody was hunting deer hunting. I was bombing around the farm field on the utility quad with my big brace on my knee. And I was tickled pink. I was happy as could be about it. So when I could finally ride my race quad, man, it was awesome. So that was kind of what came to mind thinking about you, like just thinking, man, it's just got to be so good to be at the races when you know, you didn't know that this was even going to be possible. And now you're out here winning, you know, winning pro sport and, and three overalls in one weekend, man, that's incredible. So um, I just got to say, like, I'm so darn proud of you. I'm so extremely proud. The success couldn't happen to a better or more deserving person. So what's next? Tell me, like, what are the goals for, for Ironman and beyond? Yeah, so um, the goals going forward, um, hopefully my two A classes, 450A and Production A, I'll have wrapped up. Um, as early as I can, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, after that, hopefully I'll race pro-am because this year we were just thinking, we'll just kind of take it easy with my injury, um, not race pro-am, but I mean, if, if I can at the end of the year, I'll, I'll for sure want to race pro-am because I'm, I'm still young, I'm 17. So yeah. I got a few more years to grow and mature yep. in my riding. So don't really have to push anything too much. I can go pro-am, go pro really a few years. doesn't really matter, you know? Mm-hmm. So um. Yeah, just hopefully pro am the end of this year and pro am in pro sport next year. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. You say grow, JJ. How tall are you? Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> six six right now. Really oh, hope I stop growing. Oh my god! Can't find pants or anything that fits. So. <laughs> pretty soon yeah. you're gonna. Pretty soon you're gonna be able to uh, to to stand next to Chad Weenan and you know look at the top of his head. Put your oh, yeah. you know, put put your elbow on top of him. Like hey, what are you doing yeah. down there? You're gonna yeah. be the uh, you're gonna be the the tallest guy on a quad at the racetrack. But that's got to make it so you can manhandle your machine. I've always thought like like Joe Bird back in the day, Chad obviously now all those bigger riders you got to feel like that thing's almost a pit bike oh yeah I know everyone says it looks so goofy or whatever that I'm so big on it and I need something bigger but it it's so nice going through rollers rough section stuff like that it it doesn't really matter it doesn't bother me at all so I think it helps so yeah no I, I think I think you look great I mean um, like I said, look at Chad Weenan. That's always been his, his MO. That's always been his advantage when the track gets nasty or there's whoops yeah. or, or rollers or holes or whatever. Um, that's when he really shines. So you got to use that to your advantage. Uh, and, and JJ, what I love most about you, like other than the fact that you're most, you're the most well-mannered and respectful young man I've ever met, but inside you lives a fierce competitor. When you moved up to the 250, it didn't take long and you found your winning ways on the 250. You started 
been dominating. And then, you know, you move up to the 450 last season and you found success right away. It was like the 250 all over again. It was amazing. And now you're winning in pro sport as a rookie. So like, how do you do it? Like what motivates you to just go faster and faster? This is the vibe I get from you. I'm not worried about anybody else. I'm just going to do my thing and go as fast as I can. And I have to believe like, that's kind of your, that's kind of your thing. Like you don't care about what anybody else is doing. I'm just going to go as fast as I can. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I don't really care. And I just love riding so much. I love everything about it. I love yeah. the feeling of just going as fast as you can in places that maybe you're not supposed to. Like mm -hmm. some tracks, you, some people might think, oh, you can't go that fast either. I just like to. And, you know, I have a track at my house and I love just building new stuff and just trying trying new stuff always. Like yeah. I, I, I love riding, so. That's Anything awesome. that has wheels, I, I love it. So much fun. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome to hear. You heard the man. He's the, the future. He's one of the future stars of ATV motocross, and he's already making a name for himself as a pro sport rookie. Uh, get to know this young man, a young man that I absolutely adore. JJ, congrats on all your success. Thanks so much for joining me to talk about an incredible weekend for you and your family. And uh, we'll see you at Ironman. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you, pal. That's JJ Launderville brought to you by Launderville Steel right here on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. Thanks, pal. Thank you. As the number one podcast in ATV racing, it's only right that we partner with the industry leaders in suspension tuning. Insert Impact Solutions. Impact Solutions is a full-service ATV and side-by-side -side suspension center specializing in the revalving and service of your motocross and off-road suspension. With over 25 years of elite level knowledge, experience, and testing with riders of all ages and ability levels, Casey Greek, Jay Goble, and the Impact crew strive to exceed the client's expectations for service and setup. Impact Solutions is the official Elka Suspension Service Center of the United States, offering unmatched product knowledge and experience. Whether you're in need of service, parts, warranty, sales, or technical support, Impact Solutions has you covered. Head over to ImpactSolutionsATV.com or give them a call today. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. The following message is brought to you by Manscaped.com. The Manscaped engineering team has outdone themselves this time, creating the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, now available for purchase in the U.S. and Canada. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, an official sponsor of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast, with this exclusive offer of 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0 and I am blown away. This thing is next level. What sets this trimmer apart from all the rest? The Lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn the LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. It features a new multi-functioning on-off switch with travel lock for those of us who like to travel. And my favorite, the new trimmer allows you to customize your trim with four different guard lengths and upgrade from its predecessor that only featured two. If you're listening, you know that good tools are a must, so wait no more to get the best tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com by using code DIGGINGDEEP20. Hey everyone, this is Larry Mills, president of DP Breaks North America and proud partner of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. We at DP Brakes are a longtime supporter of ATV racing and the world leader in centered brake technology, dominating the ATV world for decades by supporting the best four-wheel racers on the planet. This year's lineup includes Jeff Rastrelli, Mark Baldwin and Baldwin Motorsports, Ford Brothers Racing, Nick Janusa, and many more, including Mr. Digging Deep himself, Cody Jansen, plus all the top 17 GNCC pros such as seven-time champion Walker Fowler, Bryce O'Neill, Hunter Hart, Cole Richardson, Jared McClure, Adam McGill, and previous champion Chris Borch. These top riders continue to appreciate the high performance and impressive durability that their DP brakes have to offer. Products ultimately help place them on top of the podium week after week. DP brakes are available through www.dp-brakes.com or you can purchase them through your local parts and limited stocking dealer, or you can even message us, myself, Larry Mills, or DP Brakes on Instagram or Facebook. And if you have any questions about product or sponsorship support, 
please ask us. We are waiting for you. Join the best ATV riders in the world equipped with DP brakes and have a great year, everyone. Nearing two decades into the brand's existence, Factory 43 is back and better than ever, continuing to make major waves in the ATV world. For the third consecutive season, Factory 43 is the official aluminum parts choice of the Phoenix Racing ATV team, providing their state-of-the-art Evo Nerf bars, MX-style front bumpers, and grab bars for two-time champ Joel Hetrick. If you're in the market to upgrade your Nerf bars, bumpers, or grab bars, head over to Factory43ATV.com to see their full line of industry-leading products available for all makes and models. Head over to Factory43ATV.com today. Success in the ATV MX world is similar to what creates financial success as well. The right people, the right advice, and more importantly, hard work and the benefit of an ongoing relationship as situations change and adversity is experienced. Do you have the right financial advisor to help you reach your goals? Haymower Financial Group can create a personalized, goal-based plan to help your family prepare for whatever life brings. Call me, Scott Haymower, at Haymower Financial Group a private wealth advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services at 920-338-8150. That's 920-338-8150. Offices located in beautiful De Pere, Wisconsin, with registrations and clients nationwide. All right, back here with Shane Hitt and Casey Greek on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. Uh, we heard from J.J. Launderville there, who I absolutely adore. I love J.J. Launderville. Uh, he won Pro Sport, Production A, and 450A all at High Point. This kid is a monster, winning Pro Sport as a rookie. Uh, Shane, you were there on Saturday, at least the, the, the beginning half of Saturday. Were you able to see any uh, amateur racing, take in any amateur racing there at High Point, Shane? No, I watched some of the amateur race, and I didn't get to watch him. I watched some of the stuff, the, the, out of all the amateur stuff, the thing that surprised me most was the minis, how many there was. Yeah. I'm eight, eight full minis, so like those little DRRs and stuff. And I'm thinking, there's a lot of good kids out there that's, that's coming up. So um, I was kind of shocked because back when we raced, all you had was like an LT80 or whatever. You had to build some, take a dirt bike motor and build some kind of piece of junk, you know, right. try to race. Right. Yeah. No, the, the, the young youth classes are on the uptick for sure. Um, for all the people that, you know, say ATV racing is dead. I think when you go in, in, uh, and see, you know, all these young racers at the track and, um, I don't know the stat exactly, maybe Casey saw it, but I saw, I believe, um, Jeremy from Briarcliff had posted that it was the biggest high point turnout since 2010 Casey did you see that I don't I didn't see the number um but I saw it was the biggest high point turnout in in 12 plus years yeah definitely and I mean it was almost um really similar to what do you say 2006 or something or 2007 but there's a 601 entries total okay is what we end up having and I think it was individual it was 300 and something so it's really close in stats so i mean it, it's showing us right there like the stats are coming up you know i used to crunch these numbers a lot when i was driving the max truck and writing race reports and doing that stuff and really atv motocross averaged a lot of times let's say through that time frame you know eight or um 16 17 18 19 somewhere in there let's just throw those years a lot of times it would be 450 to 500 entries. I've seen some races be way down, you know, with threats of rain or whatever going on. So 601 entries, you know, total, I think that's pretty good number. I remember when I came in back in 2007, 2008, you know, it'd be 700, 750. So we're right there. You yeah. know, we're getting, we're building. It's not, you know, there's always going to be the naysayers. And you know what, that, that is what it is. Mm -hmm. you're not going to get rid of those guys but if you're looking at the facts and whoever's doing this you know this one's called high point by the numbers um i've seen some of the stuff for gncc that's done by racer productions but someone else is doing this one and it puts in like who had i think it's kane right it, is it okay i think so um yeah. i've seen him post it for sure so it, okay. it could very well be yeah but you know what thank you you know, yeah. to him for doing that, because this is really cool. And this is something that it's super easy to throw into like a race report. Yep. And there, there's a show in itself that we need to do one day is you're very good at it, but you can just throw this in, in your images. Mm -hmm. Boom. Look, and it shows all that kind of stuff of where we're at and where we're bringing people in from. And so, you know, yeah, thank you to Kane and for doing this, but it's awesome to see this, and I think it's going to bring a little more light to the naysayers when they can see what the entries are. 
Yeah, when you can kind of when you can shoot that down with facts of how you know good the numbers are, like I think that's awesome. And I'm a stats guy to begin with, so I think that you know, yeah, like the fastest lap times, where the racers are coming from, the you know all the all the entries. Like I think that that's just something cool to see. I think that it. I mean, I know every once in a while, like I'll see Gloop. Gloop's, you know, good about it or um, Jeffrey does it, right? Where they kind of shoot people down that are spreading negativity on the internet. And, and I like that because it's like, man, like we're all here. The, the three of us are here helping to just build up the sport, up the coverage, um, all this stuff, make the sport 1% better. And I hate when you got those people that are just trying to make it, you know, 1% worse with their stupid comment on, on something on the internet. So um, anyways, uh, let's quickly go through some of our, our amateur standouts. So obviously Jaden Launderville, he kills it, wins those three overalls. We heard from him. I, I absolutely adore that kid. Um, he's going to be a monster going forward. Aaron Salinas and Brett Music joined JJ on the podium in pro sport. Uh, that ended Brett's win streak in pro sport. Um, he won every overall until now this season so far in pro sport. So yeah, congrats to Jaden Launderville and his family. Um, as we heard from JJ conditions on Sunday, weren't nearly as good as they were on Saturday. Uh, like Shane said earlier, it was picture perfect on Saturday, not so much on Sunday, but Blair Miller survived for a pro-am win and Aaron Salinas and Paul Blair, go ahead. And Blair was in a really good position for pro sport win and got cleaned out in the second turn. It was nasty. I mean, there was like 10 guys there. I seen one video floating around somewhere. There's like 10 guys that are all piled up. They're literally on top of each other, upside down, backwards. I mean, it was insane with what went on in that first turn. So Blair, you know, obviously I'll let you continue going because you were going into that direction. But he he had himself in a really good position to win that which would have been pretty cool for him to win pro sport and pro am if, if he could have pulled that off. Yeah. Well, I knew some carnage happened in, in that second, um, in that second pro sport moto, uh, but for Blair to now have two pro am overalls and he kind of controlled the day there on Sunday and in, in pro am, which is extra notable because, you know, it's in the mud and crappy conditions, which, you know, is obviously a wild card. Um, so, so yeah, like that, that podium of Blair Miller, Aaron Salinas, and Paulo Galizzi on Sunday in Pro Am was was impressive. But Casey, I know you're a guy that works with Blair. Do you want to touch on Pro Am at all? I mean, he um, he's just quietly putting this thing together. He was a great guest on the show here a couple of weeks back, and um, man, he's he's killing it. Yeah, no, he. I honestly, I think it was you know, almost even Saturday. Just he knew, like he just he's finally starting. I don't want to say he's starting to believe in himself. I think he believes in himself well, but he just, he's going to the gate with that, that confidence. And that's exactly what we end up seeing on Sunday, even with the conditions and everything, his starts were still good. You know, everyone ran big tires. And so I think a little bit, he was nervous, like, Hey, are my starts going to be just as good with big tires? You know, he's not a guy that practices on big tires ever, let alone practices on a quad right now, you know, being that he only has one machine. So um, I think it was good for him. And, you know, there's a lot of standouts in there. There's some really good racing. I mean, you know, we, JJ did awesome in pro sport. I mean, I was, he rode really well. He put himself in really good positions. Aaron Selene is another guy that's kind of put himself in these positions and, and is almost like a veteran. I call Aaron kind of one of the veterans of that class right now where you have, you know, Dane and JJ and um, Ian Juca and these guys are coming new, fresh into the season and, and performing very well. Yeah, I agree. There's just so much good talent in, in, uh, in those classes right now. Um, it's different. Like we've been saying this, but it's different every weekend, which is amazing to see. Um, okay. So, so Shane, did you, uh, see WMX at all? The ladies of ATV motocross I posted on Saturday, Kinsey Osborne has turned into the clear cut rider to beat as a rookie in the WMX class, got both hole shots, let all the laps did the same thing on Sunday. Um, in the, the women's 15 plus class, Rodney went as far as to say she's on her way to being the greatest female ATV racer ever. Uh, but she's, she's, she's incredible, man. She's putting this thing together as a teenager in the WMX class, putting herself ahead of some of the, you know, the riders, the veterans in that class that we've seen the Andrea Bergers, Neve Shaw's that have been, you know, up front for, for five plus years in those, in those classes. Um, so she's so impressive. This might be the first you've really seen of her Shane, but were you able to see the WMX class at all? Yeah, I was standing there watching it. It ended I think it was went right before the pros did. I believe the, so. Yep, I believe so. Yep. And watched them on the on the podium and stuff. And it's the first time I watched the girls for a long time. And they're I mean they're pretty good. So and they're yeah. fun to watch. 
wondering is is that Jeremy's daughter from Briar or from yeah. from from Briar Cliff? Yep. That, I wondered if that was his daughter or not. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, that's pretty cool. In the ATV motocross world, man, she is she is killing it. And again, and I said to her, we had her on the show a few weeks ago, um, but to have her basically like like you know, Neve Shaw and and Andrea Berger are have for five plus years have been the Joel Hetrick and Chad Weenan of the WMX class. They're the clear cut, you know, riders to beat each and every weekend. And for her to go out there, say that she looks up to those riders as, as people that, you know, she, you know, role models, um, are role models to her people that she looks up to. And then to go out there and, and be putting herself ahead of these girls And this weekend, I mean, she, you know, led wire to wire, built that lead second moto. She won by like 11 seconds or whatever it was, man. She just, I'll tell you, Shane, she's, she's cut from a different cloth and to be, to have this be your starting point in the WMX class as a 16 year old, um, man, sky's the limit for her. Is she only 16? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know who she race. So, yeah. I mean, for the, if she gets much better, she's just going to have to race the guys, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Right. But it's awesome to see. Um, you said you haven't watched the girls in a while, but, you know, Jeremy from Briarcliff there and uh, tons of other people wheels up all the all the people that are getting behind the, the WMX class and the, the, the ladies of ATV motocross. They're helping to build this thing up and build up the feeder program, build up the school girl classes. And you're obviously seeing that come to fruition now with these young, talented riders being ready to rip and compete in wmx class right away but that's just awesome to see because just like you said you want the wmx class to be premier and they're doing a good job of creating that but i don't i I get like me too i don't know what she's who she's gonna race um but going forward i think that she's kind of leading this charge of young you know female racers in in creating a you know, a prestige that comes with WMX and, and that's what those riders deserve. Because I think for a lot of times, like all they had to look forward to was racing the guys, because, you know, that's all you could do. The, the WMX class wasn't premier and now they've added, um, women's 15 plus they've at, you know, school girl is getting more and more riders. I just think that that's uh, an awesome thing to see giving these, you know, young girls, something to look forward to. They look up to, I mean, Kinsey Osborne, Andrea Berger, Neve Shaw. These are, these are girls that, you know, they're, they're little girls heroes, right? Yeah. I mean, they do need to have their need to be a class for sure. I mean, they, for years like when we raced i mean the girls grew up racing with the with the boys and then they had a girls class but usually um it was small and and the girls didn't really want to race against the guys which wasn't any fair anyway Mm -hmm. so they definitely and with all the minis coming up i mean there's a lot of girls out there so they they need to have their own play Mm -hmm. yeah i agree it's awesome to see i just love to see this resurgence for for the ladies i think uh well-deserved and credit again, I think I say it every week, but credit again to all the people that are working their tails off to make this, um, this thing, this sport, this thing better for, for the, the young ladies of, of ATV racing. So there, there is some talent that's coming. That's going to be able to, you know, they're just a little bit younger than say Kinsey. You got Natalie Jackson, Shelby yeah. Shimon, you know, Lillian Plaza, she's still racing nineties, but she, I mean, she's finishing very well she's a in monster. the boys' 90 mod class. I mean, and it's no joke. Like, she she is ripping. So, yeah. we're going to get to see some more, you know, if you took Neve and Andrea out of it right away, like right now, there would be somewhat of a little gap there with, you know, where Kenzie's at. She, she obviously burst into that WMX class this year. But I think we're going to see some girls come behind her that are going to give her some fits, too. And, I, and we're going to get to see some awesome racing between all of them. Uh, again, like I said, I think it's credit to everybody that's building this thing up for the ladies, because yes, there's, there's more talent in those young, you know, young girls classes than, than we've seen in a long, long time, Casey. Oh, for sure. So uh, last thing I want to touch on is, is the 250 classes. Um, A few weeks back, we saw Joey Norris sweep all three of them. We know how stacked those 250 classes are. So he sweeps all three of them. We talked about it on the show, super impressive. And now at high point, a completely different rider, Noah Arnell uh, sweeps all three of the 250 classes this time out. That's mind blowing Casey. I mean, like, I don't even I don't know how to build it up enough, but to sweep the 250 classes is incredible. Now we've seen two different riders do it. It's, it's crazy. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, hats off to Noah. I mean, he had a very, a very bad arm injury, um, some bad luck there. And to come out, I mean, he he's like he almost didn't miss a beat already. He's already back up there flying. And so good for him. I mean, him and Joey are going to battle this thing out, I think, all year. I know Noah, I'm sure he feels like he needs to – win a bunch of races early now because Joey's won a bunch of races already. And so these two are going to be, you know, your main hopefuls, hopefuls for championships this year in the 250 classes. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised that we don't see them, you know, split a couple championships or something like that. Cause we've all known, we've all heard Noah's name a million times coming through and he's, you know, he's here and he's a real deal. And, you know, the same thing for Joey Norris, um, I mean, there's just there's a lot of good kids and a lot of talent in that 250 class. So to show up and sweep it, I think uh, people need to recognize that for sure. Yeah, I mean, again, like to, it's going to be must see. It's going to be must see every weekend to watch those two battle it out. It's going to be awesome to see. So uh, incredible amateur racing there. Um, yeah, awesome stuff at High Point. Sunday was deterred a little bit by the weather, um, but yeah, going forward we got tons of battles to monitor in in the amateur classes. So as we shift gears one final time on this episode and look forward to Ironman, guys, I think. Um, I truly think, and we touched on this a little bit, but I think that that Chad Wienan might be in danger of, of losing touch with Joel Hattrick in this championship. You know, Joel has historically been phenomenal at Ironman. At the Ironman event, he's, he's thrived in the past year after year. And with Chad Wienan, you know, in this point situation, um, not, you know, he, he can't give up any points to Joel at this point. Like uh, he can't even split motos with him. Chad needs to start putting together multiple one, one weekends, uh, you know, to kind of keep Joel within shouting distance here. Your thoughts on that, Shane, as we um, kind of conclude our coverage here and look forward to Ironman. Chad's got to turn this thing around if if he wants to, you know, keep this thing, like I said, within shouting distance. Yeah, he's definitely going to have to turn it around. He's going to have to turn around starting. He, I mean, he's getting to the point where he's going to have to win every moto. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I don't know. And sometimes sometimes uh, it's not your year. And, uh, you know, I mean, to, fin to finish second, you know, I mean, to, to Joel wouldn't I wouldn't be terrible I mean obviously you know Chad wants that ninth championship probably more than any of them but uh I I don't know I mean you, you just don't know I mean although Joel has dominated Iron Man I mean so I'm not saying Chad couldn't go in there and win but and he probably can, and he can but I don't know that he will but um I don't know man it's it's gonna be hard beating Joel in, in, in any of these tracks I mean Joel doesn't really I don't know that Joel has a bad track so <laughs> Uh, right. I mean, or anywhere, but especially the way he wrote he, the way he wrote at High Point. I mean, if he rides like that, I mean, I maybe the best I hope for is just take second. So yeah, right, exactly. You know, the one thing I will say, um, you can never count Chad out, and I know he's always up for a challenge. He likes a challenge. Uh, he's told me before, you know, on some of these shows, you know, some of the stuff we say motivates him, some of the posts motivate him, and whatever. Um, but yeah, it's going to be, I mean, he's just, he's put himself in a position where he's going to like, like we said, he's going to have to win, you know, each one of these motos, he's going to have to start stringing them together and it's going to have to start at Ironman. Uh, Casey, I'll let you jump in there. I know that you're, you know, in Joel's camp. So, you know, a person can only say so much, um, but Chad, you know, he's in, if you're in Chad's shoes, if you're part of Chad's squad, his team, um, his, you know, his, uh, motivation, his goal. We know he's got to take it one moto at a time, but he's going to need to win this thing, um, start winning these motos, you know, stringing them together. Yeah. And Chad's not an eight time champion for no reason. I mean, there's a reason that he's got those accomplishments and, and won as many races. And so you can't count Chad out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just one of those things where Joel is on fire. And yeah, we've seen him ride very well at Ironman. Mm -hmm. So, he knows that going in there and it, it's going to be tough, but he, there's no way that you can just go, okay, yeah, it's in the back. Like, no, Joel still has to win more motos. Joel still has to continue to perform where he need, you know, where he has been and keep it at that level and keep his focus. And, you know, I'm fairly confident in, you know, even talking with Joel, like he's like, it's still one moto at a time. We're not, we're not cocky. We're not, it's still, he knows, you know, we all know what Chad's capable of. So if there's anyone out there that's capable of to start stringing motos together, it's Chad Wienan, you know, and Joel Hedrick, obviously we've seen it six consecutive overalls and, you know, it, it's going to be crazy this rest of the season. And we're, you know, we're going to get some mid, 
Midwest races here, you know, Indiana, Illinois, Red Bud and stuff. And those are all, you know, close to Chad's home. So it makes the traveling's a little easier. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things. So it's going to be exciting to see and, you know, moving, moving on into this. Yeah, it is going to be exciting to see. I mean, obviously we know he brings his best at Sunset Ridge. He's going to bring his best at Red Bud, but he's going to need more than that. So it's going to need to start this weekend at Ironman. So that's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, you know, Ironman is a favorite of mine. So I'm looking forward to, to, to that. I'm looking forward to getting back to the Midwest here. Like you said, I know Chad's looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, guys, that's a wrap on our, on our review with, um, Shane hit and Casey Greek here breaking down all the action at high point. Um, Casey, as always, thank you so much for being here. Uh, do you have any, any parting, uh, words for us before we, you know, look forward to Iron Man? Um, looking forward to seeing you there in person, Casey, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to give a shout out to my buddy an awesome kid and awesome family, Mason Jackson. Uh, he had a knee injury before the season and was toughing it out. And I think we've all seen the video of him casing the uphill triple and kind of resprung that. And I, I don't know. I, I think he should sit the year out, but who knows? Um, I, he's young. He's got a long future ahead of him. But I know how tough he is, and there, there's a good chance we probably see him racing at Ironman. But um, I just hope he heals up quick and, and gets it together, um, you know, gets his knee fixed and gets back out there because that's someone that has the talent and the moving forward that could be one of these great pros that we talk about now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, obviously thoughts and prayers to him. I was wondering what he had injured. I saw the video there. Um, but yeah, thinking about him and, um, yeah, Casey, like I said, I appreciate you being here so much. Obviously I always appreciate everything that you bring to these shows and, uh, Shane, uh, again, you, you as well. I appreciate it so much. What an honor this was, uh, to get you back on the show here, talk about the racing. I can't thank you enough for your time and, uh, yeah, look forward to doing this again soon. You gotta, you gotta get to more of these races because man, I love the, the insight, the, the expert expertise, all the stuff that you bring to, uh, you know, a race review like this. It's awesome to, to hear from a legend never gets old. So I can't thank you enough for your time. No, it's been good. I mean, I, I wish I could get to all of them, you know, I mean, I'll see, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I love going to the races, you know, I like watching, I like watching Joe and Chad battled out, um, you know, and I like them both. They're both great guys. I like to see, you know, Chad, maybe get up there and a couple motos, tighten this thing up a little bit, at least make it interesting um but you know it's it's always fun coming on your show and uh i'm gonna try to make a couple more races for this year's over so uh i don't know i thought about coming to Loretta's this year and hanging out i haven't been there for a while so yeah um, but it's uh but that, and that's you know but loretta's in the last race this year is it it is yep it is this year yep yeah, that's, I always just like to go to the last one. So Yeah, yeah, it's the culmination it of a great good. year. It's the culmination of a great year. But, yeah, Shane, like I said, um, just just you're, you're an ATV racing legend. Uh, just awesome to have you here to, to join us, break down the races. And, uh, like I said, share your expertise. It's been, it's been an honor, as always. Yep, th thanks for having me. Um, you, you and Casey, you guys have a good day, and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks so much, Shane. Thanks, Casey. That's a wrap for our High Point review. Uh, we're going to throw it to one last break, and then we'll come back with one final segment looking ahead to Iron Man with a gentleman who will be making his return to Pro Class Racing there in Indiana. Stay with us. Thanks so much, guys. Insurance. It's not something everyone likes to talk about. But let's face it. If you race motocross, it's something you should have. Integrative Financial Concepts is an independent financial service and insurance firm who offers moto-friendly insurance and helps out riders like Nick Janusa, Jeffrey Rastrelli, and Joel Hetrick gain confidence on the track. With their unique safe to race and safe to ride programs, if you qualify, they have the ability to offer life insurance with living benefits to those who ride. With these living benefits, you may have the ability to access a portion of your life insurance policy while you're still living for things like cancer, heart attack, stroke, or chronic illness. They can also help with many other things, such as home, auto, motorhome, and trailer insurance, as well as college planning, special needs planning, payroll processing, as well as group health benefits for your business. So whether something happens on or off the track, Integrative Financial Concepts has you covered. With their complimentary one-on-one -on -one appointments, what are you waiting for? Reach out to Mike Daniele at D-A-N-I-E-L-E -E underscore Michael at nlgroupmail.com today and see how Integrated Financial Concepts can help you. 
Living benefit riders are supplemental benefits that can be added to a life insurance policy and are not suitable unless you have the need for life insurance. Riders are optional and may require additional premium and may not be available in all states or on all products. This is not a solicitation for any specific insurance policy. Just like the sport of ATV motocross as a whole, our Digging Deep community is brought together by the love for racing that we all share. Our sport is compiled of many great people and leading that charge is the Launderville family at Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. This racing-owned family business is a steel and concrete supplier serving the entire United States. Launderville Steel is a full-service steel supplier of new and surplus steel, aluminum, and stainless steel products headlined by the 4130 chromoly tubing and plate used in the building of chassis for ATVs and UTVs, off-road truck racing, late model dirt and pro tractor pulling series, drag racing, and more. Launderville Steel loves their racing just as much as we do, but don't forget about their concrete division as well. With over 25 years of experience, the concrete division can supply everything you need to complete your next business or personal project. Their central Midwest location enables LSE to easily serve customers across the United States. For a quote, additional info, answers to more of your questions, or to talk a little racing, head over to LaundervilleSteel.com or give them a call today. We are proud to be partnered with yet another racer-owned company. Thank you, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. Here at Digging Deep, we have an obvious passion for ATVs and pridefully enjoy sharing the sport's history. Since 2019, when the podcast was born, we've been working to partner with individuals who share our passion, but one man and his vision had been missing from our partnership group until now. When it comes to the sport's history, the hallowed grounds of Binky's Forever ATC Museum has it all. Binky Tapscott's mind-blowing collection of three- and four-wheelers has preserved history by spanning all makes and models from Honda three-wheelers in chronological order to unique builds that shaped ATV racing as we know it, like Doug Gust's iconic DRZ-powered hybrid thumper and everything in between. There's no denying Binky's passion, a passion that we certainly relate to here at Digging Deep. Binky's goal is to share his amazing collection with fellow enthusiasts by making his prized possessions accessible to the public via scheduled visits. Follow Forever ATC Museum on Facebook and watch foreveratc.com for further updates on possibly getting a chance to see Binky's Forever ATC Museum for yourself. We are proud to welcome Binky's Forever ATC Museum to the Digging Deep family. We recite on every Digging Deep episode that we are all about aligning with others who share our passion and love for ATVs. And that's exactly what Blends All is. For more than 60 years, Blends All Racing Oil has been the secret choice of many championship winning riders and engine builders. From world championship kart racing in Europe, to California speedway racing, or the mud and rocks of East Coast cross country racing, thousands of hardcore racers know that nothing out lubricates or outperforms Blends All. Even with Blends All's wide reach into all forms of racing, Blends All's lead man David Schloss admits that ATV riders are his people. In fact, he's been an ATV enthusiast since 1986 when he first threw a leg over a Suzuki Quad Sport 230. Fun fact, his passion for ATV racing even led him to launch a popular ATV racing magazine in the mid-2000s called ATV Insider. So Blends All is a small family-owned business that blends and bottles all of its products in Ohio and has ATV roots? Sign us up. That's why Blends All is the oil choice of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. To learn more about Blenzol's rich heritage or to shop Blenzol's full line of 2T and 4T racing lubricants, visit Blenzol.com and follow them at Blenzol on Instagram. Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant. The best power sports coolant on the market, Evans prevents overheating and boil over so you need not worry about harming your engine or suffering a premature end to your ride no matter what the conditions. Designed for use in ATVs, UTVs, motorcycles, and other power sports equipment, when conditions are at their worst, Evans is at its best. Upgrade to Evans now to avoid overheating and boil over next time you hit the track or trail. Use discount code DIGGINGDEEP20 at checkout to save at EvansCoolant.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to support our partners. Now back to the show. All right, guys, as we look ahead to Iron Man, I'm absolutely stoked for Crawfordsville, by the way. And this final guest is one of the many reasons why I'm so excited. He announced that he's coming out of his pro class retirement to line up once again uh, some eight or nine years later after his last time he lined up for the AMA to be pro class brought to you by our friends at SSI decals making your identity stick with graphics and decals made exactly to your liking get started today at SSI decals.com he's back say hello to the one two three kid Nick DeNoble welcome back to the show brother hi everyone yeah I'm sure you heard the news and everything so everything's going good here we are that's awesome. No, I, I, we needed to get you on at least to, to, to chat about this a little bit. Uh, so 
over over the course of like the last couple of weeks, I've been you know getting more and more excited for this thing. Uh, it was a little over a week ago that uh, you announced that eight years after last lining up for the AMA TV Pro Class, you're returning to the Pro Class at Ironman. So Nick, why now? Like, what motivated you to jump back into the Pro Class now in 2022? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, honestly. I go out there. I know I'm going to go show back up to work Monday. I'm not going to, there's, I've, you know, I've, re- I've raced one race last two years and those are amateur classes, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know. I, I got in my mind that I'm going to run the whole moto, you know, mm-hmm. I think I just want to do it for me. And I don't know, just to prove that us old guys that, work all the time and have no time to train Mm -hmm. you know put your mind to you can do it yet you know yeah yeah well and i think with and and correct me if i'm wrong but with the girls getting you know more and more into riding right i'm assuming that that's some of the motivating factor too you know with you know you have more atvs in your life than you probably did five years ago right so i gotta believe that that's part of it yeah 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 it really is you know and I posted something, you know, with the new gear, deja vu gear, uh, you know, the unicorns and rainbows and, yeah. you know, just, yeah, with the girls riding and stuff and they say they want to race and everything. And mm-hmm. well, I don't know. <laughs> dad's got to race it. too. Dad's got to race yeah. too. We're not going to the track and dad's not no. going to not race. And if he's going to race, yeah. he might as well race the pro class. That's, yeah. that's the thinking here. <laughs> yeah. Pretty <laughs> much. You know, and just. You know, I always told him that I always want him to have, like, I've always wanted to have a daughter that race pro ATV motocross. Like, mm-hmm. what what motocross dad doesn't want their daughter to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. And and look at Andrea Berger. I mean, she's killing it, and she'd probably do pretty good there, too, you know? Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's that's what I want their mindsets, you know? <laughs> no, I think that that's awesome. I love it, man. I love it. I really do. Uh, I think the the last couple of years, it's been awesome having you, you know, at, like you said, at, at a race or two a year, I think that that's been awesome. And like, I simply love the fact that, you know, you, uh, like myself and like so many other people listening right now that, you know, you're bit by this bug and you like, can't resist just still wanting to be a part of it at some capacity. There's nothing like it. And I think that that's kind of what you're, what you're hinting at. Like, there's nothing like that feeling of being at the racetrack and, and uh, and, and riding your quad. Like that's, that's kind of like an escape for some people. And I think that that's kind of what you're getting at. There's nothing like it. Yeah. I was bitten by the, I was bitten by the bug, you know, and luckily, you know, after my bad uh, knee injury in 2016, here I am, uh, five, six years later, going running for all. It's awesome. So, so Nick, what's the goal? Is it to, to make all the laps? Is it to finish top 10? Um, what's the goal? So, so I got this before you tell me the goal, I got the stats. So it's going to be 2,907 days or seven years and 11 months and 15 days since you last lined up as a professional. And that was only when you, you know, when you lined up that one race, you came out for, for just Walnut yep. that year. So it was even like another year. It was yeah. almost nine full years since you've been a full-time pro. So 2,907 days will have went by from pro class lining up back then to pro <laughs> class now. So what is the, what is the goal when you go out there nearly 3,000 days later? Uh, honestly, just, I just want to finish the motos. Awesome. I just, uh, well, and pull a whole shot or two, you know, <laughs> I yanked one last year you know against those hybrid quads and stuff you know i mean that's pretty impressive going against those and in pro sport I don't yeah. know, rip a whole shot maybe two and all i want to do is finish the race you know i know i'm not going to keep up with Ristrelli, ween and lindquist mm-hmm. you know uh head I, I ain't gonna keep up with those guys so yep as long as i finish it that's all i'm looking forward you know yeah and, for, for sure you know, and just enjoy it, you know, and I can actually for, for 20 minutes, I can just set my pace sprint. Cause I know I can do five, maybe six hard sprint laps. You know, I'm just 
I'm just set my mind to that. And I mean, hopefully I do that and then just ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. I, so, so I was going to say that was my next question was going to be, what are the odds that we see one of those patented Nick DeNoble hole shots, you know, and you'll have your hand up in the air. Right. And, um, or I'm thinking a heel clicker. We might see a uh, heel clicker or two. I oh, feel yeah. like, I feel like you won't be able to resist pal. Oh, no, that's going to happen for sure. You know, <laughs> heel clicker for sure. I'm going to try the whole shot. You know, I got the Jansen motor in there pulling. I have the same setup I had as when I was ripping whole shots and running top five, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. That's awesome. So there's obviously going to be uh, some people out there that are going to, some fans selecting you and digging deep eight to BMX fantasy. We got you added to the game now. So there's going to be people wanting you uh, on their squad. What message do you have for anyone who does end up picking you next weekend? Uh, what did you tell me, Nick? What did you text me? You said, I'm not going to get last. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's what I'm shooting for. Is that, I mean, I'm not going to get last, you know, it, yeah. I don't know. It's, would it be awesome to get a top 10? Hey, you'd never know what happens. Racing's race and things happen to, you know, mm-hmm. riders and who knows? I just might be the little fly in the back hanging out. <laughs> hey, hey, and I don't not, I don't mean this as a joke at all. Cause I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of no. any of this, but what if, what if it were to rain, Nick? What if it were to I, rain? You put this was, thing on the podium before it. We talked to Nick Janusa earlier. It rains. We talked about it, it rains every time we go to Iron Man. So it. what? What if it were to rain and and you're you know you get a whole shot and you're up in the mix, man? Like oh, what if? You know, it, like I was telling Jenna, you know, like yeah, I'm good in the mud. And I was I was looking at the forecast and it was actually next weekend where it's supposed to be raining Thursday and Friday. I'm like, damn, I wish that was the following weekend because. I got the old stock Honda tires and wheels sitting in the trailer. We'll throw on the stockers and go out there and rip it. There <laughs> rip <you> it. In- <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. It, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's so cool. Like I said, I'm, I'm stoked to have you back at the races yeah. at any capacity. Um, but I just think this is the coolest thing. I think at the end of the day, as long as you know, you're out there, you're having some fun. It's a, it's a weekend spent at the racetrack with a smile on your face. I think, if that's what happens, I think it's a weekend well spent in my mind. And uh, man, I'm just excited to see the one, two, three back out there in the pro class. It's going to be surreal. I, w- I wouldn't, I wouldn't have bet in a million years that we were going to see this, pal. No, honestly, neither did I. You <laughs> how, did you, know, but... how did you get Jenna to sign off on this? Uh, she just <laughs> how frustrated I was, you know, at the last two years getting tangled up, you know, sure. yep. the motos and stuff and me getting frustrated too, you know, you just, you bust your balls working. You got one weekend to run it. Mm -hmm. There, I know if I pull to the side, I'm not going to get packed in the back, you know, and, you know, I just know their lines and everything like that, you know, I was saying it, as long as I make it to work Monday, I got a smile on my face. Like you said, on in going through the whole weekend, which why not? I'm going to be in the pro pits with the boys. (laughs) racing the big dogs like the old days. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I'm uh, I'm proud of you. I really am. I think that this is the coolest yeah. thing. Like I said, this is this whole storyline is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to, to Iron Man so much. Um, so we sure are looking forward to it. I know, I know you could tell by the internet. I know a lot of people are looking forward to it. So I appreciate you jumping on here to talk to us about it a little bit. And uh, man, it's going to be, it's going to be so much fun. It is, this has been a blast talking about it, but uh, man, I'm counting down the days until next week and it's going to be a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm counting down the days too. And then counting down the days to my heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be good. You know, I'm, I'm in shape, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm 230. I, it's not like I gained a bunch of weight since my pro race. And, you know, Jen's like, this is probably some of the best shape you're in. Yeah. I haven't been riding or mm-hmm. working, working, doing a lot of labor work and, you know, so mm-hmm. just go for it and going to have fun. It's going to be great seeing everyone, you know, that's why, that's why I got to come back. And I started two years ago, mm-hmm. just miss one, you know, it's a whole family, you know, like you said, it's in your blood and yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, we're it's just gonna, gonna go. 
for it, you know? It's, it's going to be a blast, dude. What you have working on your side is that you're like one of the most naturally talented ATV riders I've ever met in all of my life, right? So you get on that thing and and I don't care if you've been riding. I don't care how good of riding shape you're in. None of that stuff. I, you get no. on your four-wheeler and, uh, and, and it takes you right back because I remember, so I remember, I don't know what year it would have been. It must've been that 15 year and you weren't racing full time. And, uh, I was, uh, pro for a couple of years at that point. And I'm like, man, I just, yeah. Nick cannot show up at this race and beat me, <laughs> not show up at this race and beat me, yeah. not racing all, you know, he's not racing the season, not racing the whole series. And I'm pretty sure you were ahead of me. I'm pretty sure you beat me in the first moto and gave me, and gave me your gate for the second moto. Wasn't that the story? I'm almost positive it was. So anyways, anyways, one of the most naturally talented riders that I've ever met in all of my life. And uh, man, it's going to be, it's going to be a blast to, to see you out there again. It's just, uh, it, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. I've looked up to you my whole life. So it's going to be, this is just another reason why. Yeah. And then, and I appreciate it all. You know, I appreciate the love and everything support, you know, you and everyone's given. And, and yeah, like you said, I mean, you looked up to me and I looked up to you right in too. I mean, we're, we grew up by each other, you know, through this whole thing. And it's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just pumped for, you know, I'm just pumped. You know, yeah. I just, as long as I finish, I'm happy, man. That's awesome. And like I said, hopefully rip a whole shot. Honestly, if I rip one whole shot, that'll be, yeah. Weekend be, made. Weekend yeah, made. Yeah. For sure. Well, hey, pal, I appreciate, I, I really do. I appreciate the time here. Appreciate you That's, chatting about it. It's getting yeah. everybody excited. It's getting me excited. And uh, next next stop, Iron Man, I guess. Next I, stop, Iron Man. <laughs> you know, and, and also a reason to go pro is I was never at Iron Man, you know. Oh, sure. and And so – and seeing all those big jumps, I was always a, I was always a jumper, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know I'm going to bomb all those. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No doubt in my mind, Nick, you know, and it's just, like I said, the track we've never been to, the lady gave me the okay. And the kids are pumped, you know, mm -hmm. I got my buddy, Nick Zeke and coming down wrenching for me. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just going to be a good weekend. I got, I got good vibes for the last couple of weeks and how many more weeks to go into it. So there you go. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate the time. Uh, look, really looking forward to it and uh, we'll see you there. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. You're the man. That's Nick DeNoble right here talking about his return to professional racing right here on the Digging Deep ATBMX podcast brought to you by SSI decals. See you pal. Appreciate it. All right. I have to thank our presenting sponsors who brought you a stacked guest list tonight. Thanks to Manscaped, Launderville Steel, Integrative Financial Concepts, and SSI Decals. All the best in the business at what they do. And major thanks to all of tonight's incredible guests. Shane Hitt, Legend, Nick Janusa, Jaden Launderville, Nick DeNoble, and Casey Greek. Thanks to producer Dallas Jansen, my brother, for all his hard work. Once again, thanks to the Ford Brothers Racing family, and shout out to a couple of legends that made their way back to the races at High Point. Rodney Tomlin was back. Thanks so much for the shout out on Quad Radio, Rodney. That always makes me so proud. And shout out to Ken Hill as well, whose health has allowed him to be back at the races. What a blessing it is. Ken is the man, and we appreciate him so much for allowing us to use his work in our social posts. So shout out to those guys for being back at the races. It just feels right. Thanks to our donors. You know who you are. We appreciate you so much. Thanks to all of our partners. CST Tires. Go to shop.csttires.com today. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew. SSI decals, DID racing chain, Namira technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV components, impact solutions, Launderville steel enterprises and concrete supply, the financial advice of the Haymower financial group, four works carbon, DP brakes, factory 43 integrated financial concepts and their safe to race and safe to ride insurance programs, Binky's forever ATC museum, blends all oil, the official oil choice of digging deep Evans, waterless power sports, coolant and manscaped to get 20% off and free shipping with code digging deep 20 at manscaped.com support the brands that support our show and don't forget to use those codes to save find it all on our website and be sure to click those rocky mountain atvmc and amazon banners for all your gear and parts needs everyday needs and to help us out 
And most of all, thanks to you guys for listening. Our show merchandise, including our new Can't Win Tees, are all available at shop.diggingdeepatbmx.com, so check that out. And if you're looking for another easy way to help support us, visit our website and click the Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee buttons. This allows you to set up a one-time or monthly contribution to support our efforts. Give us a call using our voicemail line. Give us your reaction to the show, the races, and everything in between so we can play them on the show and react to what you have to say. That number is 920-569-3519. We want to hear from you, so give us a call. Follow the show on social media, Digging Deep ATVMX Podcast, and myself, Cody Jansen, for additional content coverage and more fun stuff as the 2022 season unfolds. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. All episodes, additional podcast providers, sponsor links, and discount codes, or show merchandise, fantasy info, and more can all be found on our website, diggingdeepatvmx.com, so check that out today. Shout out to our Digging Deep ATVMX Fantasy winners from High Point, Casey Beaver, Darren McPherson, Spencer Delabru, Jim Hardy, Trevor Poole, Eliza Capen, and Jacob. While we're sending out your prizes, I'll just be over here sporting my I Can't Win Digging Deep ATVMX Fantasy shirt, so don't mind me. Be a friend, tell a friend. Please download, subscribe, rate, review, and share. And with that, for Shane Hit. Nick Janusa, Jaden Launderville, Nick DeNoble, Casey Greek, Brooke Catherine, Dallas Jansen, and I'm your host, Cody Jansen. Thanks for listening to and making us the number one podcast in ATV racing. With over 153,000 downloads last month in 87 total countries. Until next time, thanks for joining us in digging deep with the stars of ATV Motocross. See you at Ironman. Things are crashing and burning here at the Digging Deep Podcast, much like the Titanic. Those guys were hauling ass, for real. I remember watching Doug Gus, I don't know who it was, Steel City, running the same times Friday afternoon as James Stewart was on Sunday back then. It was mental. I've never seen quads go that fast. Quad are freaking gnarly.